Hello, everybody. Sorry, I got caught off guard. I was making sure I didn't wasn't missing anything from the earlier messages, but they mostly seem to be here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Poppy seeds came up twice. Either did it twice, or it's there. Let's see. I've got uh, Fountainburg Klein. Okay, yeah. I think we got everything. I'm making sure I didn't miss any early, early uh, questions. Let's see how everybody's doing okay with today. Beautiful weather here. Uh, I assume if you're not in the uh, storms of of uh, Colorado, not Colorado, California, you're also enjoying this beautiful spring day. Um, your mileage may vary, but mine is fantastic. So let's start with uh, JM's question. He's got an amp that runs a single 6v6. Huh. So... TAD and JJs are fine, but the tongue saws are weird ghost notes. Uh, you may have a bad batch of, of tongue saws, or it's possible that the uh, that the plate voltage or screen voltage or both is really a little bit higher in that design than a traditional 6v6 would enjoy. A JJ uh, can handle almost 500 volts, and the TAD is like 475. A tongue saws nominally 400 so that might be the root of that. Um, either that or you just have a bad batch of, of uh, TA, I'm sorry, tongue saws. Let's see. Ah, yeah, driver tube. Yeah, uh, well, Jatuka, the uh, 12AT7 design, um, the 12AT7 use, rather, in the uh, reverb driver stage of the AB763 amps and the AA768, et cetera, all the Fender reverbs from the 60s and early 70s. That 12AT is really being punished. It's being run well over spec in a lot of ways. Um, but they generally they generally handle it. Um, uh, you know, not always, but it's a case of sometimes when you abuse a tube, it works. Now, that specifically is made worse by the change some of the Fender amps had in the 70s where they changed from the uh, uh, 2.2K bypass with a 25 microfarad cap on that cathode, ju just down to like a, a sometimes a, a 680 ohm, sometimes a 470 ohm resistor unbypassed, and that really punishes those 12 AT7s and tends to burn up that resistor in the process. So the uh, earlier 2.2K um, bypass by 25K is the best of a bad approach. Remember what they're emulating there is, uh, I think, the 6K6 circuit from the um, older um, uh, version of the standalone reverb unit. They use 6K6s, and it can also be done with EL84s, both of which are, you know, power tubes. And basically, in the most fenders, they're using a 12AT7 as a power tube, and it's not really suited for it, but they tend to make it. And uh, you can get the Joint Army Navy. 70s Phillips for about forty dollars these days from some of the some of the vendors out there, and they will last longer typically than most current production. Poppy seeds. Any tips to increase headroom on a super reverb reissue? Uh, same as any uh, Fender reverb amp. You can play around with fifty seven fifty ones. You can try a twelve uh, a Y seven if you really want to reduce gain and give yourself some headroom. Uh, in general, if you were to do a 5751 for a V1 and V2 and maybe a 12 uh, AT7, uh, um, sorry, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? No, that's pretty much all you can do. You can play around V1 and V2 being 12, uh, 5751s or 12 AY7s if you really want to lower gain. And you can also play around with V3 if, if you wish. I'm sorry, V4 the reverb recovery stage. Beyond that, um, if it's not enough headroom for you, and there's also the number two input jack, something's wrong with your amp because those have a lot of headroom. Uh, it depends on what you're looking for. You can't make a super reverb sound like, you know, uh, uh, a Music Man one, HD 150 or whatever, or 130, whatever it was called, the big solid state uh, headroom monsters. Wrong button. Let's see. Hey, Vinicius, hope you're feeling better. Uh, what's my take on overdrive pedals that rely on tubes? He's been dreaming about a BK Butler tube driver. Well, they they they, they vary. They're little, porky. 
they vary a lot in quality and they vary a lot in in sound the um uh tube driver the the butler is okay uh I have never found it fantastic. It can work really well in certain rigs. Eric Johnson and David Gilmore have certainly used it, I, uh, though I suspect that Pete Cornish has twiddled with, uh, with uh, Gilmore's quite a bit. And there are others out there that use the tube as marketing. You know, it's got a tube, T-O-O-B. And there are bad executions like the matchless turt box and hot box are, are pretty junky. You can see that on my channel. The, um, um, uh, the exception, uh, the Kingsley pedals are fantastic. If I were going to go to the extreme of having a tube-based overdrive pedal, I would look at Kingsley over uh, Butler, um, both in terms of performance and sound, but also cost. The, uh, the Butler stuff costs insane amounts. Hey, Fountainburg Quine, uh, uh, your other profile, Chris. Hey, uh, the key casino play is great. I've just got to change out the pickups because they're so dark and unpleasant when you when you dig in, um, uh, and and I've got some medical bills left for my daughter's experiences throughout all of January. So the the pickup change will be coming in maybe two months. I've got to pay the bills. Kidneys kidneys new pair of gallbladders, fun. Hey, Yomar or, or Jomar, I have no experience with uh, uh, Garnet Amps. Good morning, all. Hey, Chris Butler and Clyde and Emmett and Otto and Charlie. Uh, everyone, if I, don't, if I don't name you, that doesn't mean I don't love you. Um, Lion Circle, when does capacitor form factor matter? Can I just use, use the smallest form factor for electrolytic caps? Um, the really... The biggest thing you want to look at there for electrolytic caps is ESR and capacitance and the voltage rated rating and the, the temperature rating. And um, then you're also going to get into issues of, of ripple uh, handling and all that fun stuff. You know, how much AC can it handle without, without bad things happening? But if you have two comparably spec uh, capacitors and one's smaller than the other, uh, you go with what, whichever you wish. Um, a lot of times there's a trade-off. You'll notice that, hey, yeah, this one's got a much smaller diameter, but it's much taller, um, and or vice versa. So, you know, uh, but look at the the important specs, and then within the important specs, find the one that physically fits the space the best for your needs. And it's good to physically keep some separation between components when possible. So if you have... Very small capacitors, don't put them together just because you can. You may want to leave a little bit of space around them anyway. Dennis is here from Kankakee. Bambule got a 135 twin. What would I do with the one if it were mine? I would remove all the spaghetti. I would get as much wax off the board as possible. I would change the uh, 10 nanofarad input cap on the uh, phase inverter to a 3.3 nanofarad. I would remove the, uh, the snubber, snubber caps, the 2.2 uh, uh, nanofarads from the grid to ground in the output tubes. I might play around with, with removing the, the snubber cap across the reverb return to ground um, because if you remove the spaghetti and you get rid of the DC on the, on the board, you're less likely to have um, any oscillation that needs the, the dampening from those uh, added snubber caps. I would um, make sure that the cathode for V3 is the aforementioned 2.2K bypass with a 25 uh, microfarad versus just like a 680 or 470 by itself. And I would make sure that the pots are all um, the correct tapers. So for volumes and trebles, they'd be 30% audio taper or J taper. For the base and um, and mids, mid pots, they would be 10% uh, audio taper or a log. And that's what I would do. And I'd make sure it had uh, good tubes and all the tube sockets were clean and everything had tension and it was biased correctly. And I like the speakers. And uh, make sure... Um, Sometimes the uh, on, on the later air uh, fenders, I've got some weird things on my screen. Oh, I got crosshairs. I didn't mean to have crosshairs. Anyway, um, that's not affecting you guys. It's just changing what I see. Um, um, 
The uh, baffle is Velcroed on. It's a separate baffle that holds the grill cloth. That can come loose. So sometimes you kind of get those frames wet and clamp them down flat and let them dry flat and get fresh uh, Velcro because they can flap. It's a very long answer to uh, a series of uh, simple questions. Uh, I don't think of Russian PIO caps and apps. I think it's just asking for problems. Um, Paper and oil is uh, only important to those who sell paper and oil. Uh, I use capacitors uh, based on their performance and their sound, not what they look like, and I never reach for paper and oil caps. Uh, I just don't. I I think it's, uh, you know, people selling... $60 $60 bumblebees that are just little mylar caps coated in, in, in plastic um, or selling you old, defective uh, black cats that don't work in apps anymore, stick it in Les Paul, t- it'll work in Les Paul, but it'll sound the same as a five-cent cap, but you pay an awful lot for that privilege. Hey, Evil Grusler or Gressler, thank you very much. Do I have any pointers on enabling you to use an attenuator on an AC15C1? Well, you just run the, uh, the speaker out of the AC15C1 into the attenuator and from the attenuator to the speakers. Now, the issue you may be running into is that the uh, in an AC15C1, uh, the internal speakers are hardwired to the cab, uh, but, you, but there's an external uh, jack and an auxiliary jack. And what you, uh, external jack and an extension jack, you could um, either. Um, uh, install uh, new wires from the speakers uh, to a uh, inline plug. Uh, just cut the wire coming out of the amp going to the speakers and put uh, a switchcraft plug and a switchcraft uh, female you know, uh, inline jack there. So you could you know actually reverse it so the jack's coming down and the plug's coming up. Uh, that would be a place where you could uh, uh, disconnect it and ins- install the attenuator. Or you could use the extension jack on the back, which turns off the internal speaker wires, run into the attenuator, and then go uh, with a new series of wires to the speakers. Hey, Chris, I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know uh, what the BAM 200s are. Um, I'm not sure what, what I said to lead you to think that they might they might be they might be great tc uh can have some problematic quality um you know i've got a polytune that's been working great for years and years and a buddy's got this shaker where the uh power jack can you see it has got smashed, and it's a weird form factor that I've not been able to find on Mauser or DigiKey yet, and TC has been of no use for that. But I don't know what a BAM200 is, and I don't have any thoughts about a Seymour Duncan Power Stage stereo pedal because I don't know what those are. Um, I would not trust a pedal as a power amp. It just It's instinctively. It's not anything empirical. Certainly with no direct experience there. It just seems... It's an overpromise. It's an overpromise from a small device. Uh, I think a, a, a power amp can be small, but I don't think it should be a, a pedal form factor. I could be wrong. That's not my world. But instinctively, I would I would take many grains of salt with that. And yeah, the AC fifteen C one does have a master volume and a pretty good one. Um. Why does the power switch get really hot in the Marshall SJ? Is this normal behavior? Um, I'm not, the SJ is that new one, right? I'm unfamiliar with that model. I've not had it yet. Uh, If the power switch is getting really hot, it may be just very physically close to the power transformer, or that switch may be beginning to arc. Um, I would have to have a sample size of, of, more than one and I don't I've not had that model at all so um uh see Chris Butler sorry uh I have not seen the design f- for the uh TC class D micro bass head you might be thinking of, of Brad he might have sorry um I'd be concerned if your power switch is getting really hot because the switch itself could be burning inside the, uh the switches we use um 
for apps are rated for AC rather than DC. So it's more common for the DC switches like standbys to fail than, than power switches. But it, it is possible. So um, I would look to a local tech, the Massimir, and see if that can be confirmed before something burns out. I have no experience or opinion of Synergy amps other, and modules other than Bruce and Dave tend to make very good stuff. So, um, 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 you know, hopefully they're fun, fantastic. Jeffrey Soper, I ha am behind on emails chronically. I will, I will look for that. Sorry. Okay, uh, talk about pentode inso input stages. My favorites are the 5879 and the EF86. Um, currently, it's a lot easier to get a good 5879 than to get a good uh, EF86. You can get fantastic sounds with them, but you can also get fantastic sounds with uh, cascode triode uh, triodes, and you can just... Uh, gain staging traditional triodes but it is nice to be able to get all that goodness out of just one pentode um, i really do like pentode preamp tubes but um, the current production ef86 is kind of terrible thank you alex 2112 i appreciate that i have a feeling i like your taste in music all right uh, thank you sean blythe and, and rex fx thanks for replying to chris um, thoughts on whether cab material pine versus plywood impacts tones for a combo amp it absolutely does in unpredictable ways uh, you could have five uh, plywood cabs they're all going to sound much the same because a lot of the variation in the wood and the density and the moisture levels and etc have been taken out of the equation and they're much more rigid so you're going to have five very consistent sounding cabs. You can have five pine cabs, which are going to sound all over the place. One of them, are, one of them is going to sound magical. Some of them are going to sound just fine. One of them may be a dud, uh, just because of uh, weight and resonance and stiffness and moisture content. And, that, and you know, the dud may sound better in ten years, or you could have a really humid summer and the great one doesn't sound very good for a while. Um, these are weird things with wood. Um, there's a certain resonance to pine, which can be very nice in, in certain amps, but resonance in general is the enemy of uh, designing how a speaker is going to react. So um, we're all pine this and lightweight that, and meanwhile people designing speaker cabinets want to eliminate all resonance or at least know exactly what it is and have a known um, unchanging stiffness uh, or that changes only within a known margin so they can predict how the speaker does and the cab design overall will work. So when you get a great sounding pine cab, uh, it's almost an accident of fate. The stars just aligned and uh, go with it, but it's, it's hard to predict. I don't have any good opinion of Bouguera amps, Stephen George. I'm sorry. Uh, they're just really, really bad copies of, of better amps. And the uh, Infinium, I thought, was just kind of a garbage circuit. Um, and I know that makes me sound like an amp snob, and I'm not. Um, uh, I think in that price range, uh, the uh, AC15C1 is a fantastic amp. In that same price range, even the little uh, Jet Cities with a little bit of, of love and care can be made to be, be much better amps than Bouguera and give some more sounds. Um, but the Bouguera stuff, uh, Bouguera and, and Behringer have always rubbed me the wrong way. Um, they don't respect IP in the slightest, and neither do they respect their customers because they sell absolute garbage. Oh, the micro bass heads. Yeah, uh, Chris Butler. Yeah, those. I had one of those in. It was absolute junk. Um, and it was, it was just a bad, bad implementation very complicated bad implementation of a solid state pedal preamp basically into an ice module and the ice module fails as ice modules tend to do and uh but that wasn't the biggest issue the biggest issue is they had a multi-layer board uh which was pretty much non-repairable 
Uh, and TC doesn't design them to be repaired. They design them to be swapped out. And every time I say this in a video, someone's like, oh, you old fossil, don't you know that you can fix surface mount? You know, blah, 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 what a hack, what a hack. Yeah, of course I can fix surf surface mount. I can fix surface mount if everything's on the surface as opposed to inner layers that, that burn of a board. If uh, I am provided with the schematic, um, I don't need a schematic to figure out a copy of a deluxe reverb, but if you have something which has digital that, modeling this, and all these complicated switches, like, say, a, a Boss Katana, yeah, it'd be really nice if I had the uh, manual because it would take me, like, 10 hours to trace out what the circuit's doing, and who would pay for that? Uh, which I don't think most people really want. And it's really hard to do surface mount here if all around it are vertical through hole capacitors like you find on the uh, AC10C1, like you find on the uh, uh, the earlier versions of a lot of the uh, Black Star HT Club 40s, where if I needed to change out that surface mount thing, I would first need to remove 10 through hole uh, electrolytic capacitors to be able to reach where the, the surface mount stuff is uh, because they didn't design it to be serviced. And everyone's like, oh, he doesn't know how to do surface mount. He's old. <laughs> Fuck y'all. <laughs> anyway, I, I digress. Hey, Andy, thank you very much. Uh, 62 concert starts crackling after pop and popping after one hour of play. Uh, okay. Nose, noises go away when pressing backing board away from main board. You, sir, have got a conductive board. And as it gets to a certain temperature, yeah, that conductivity builds and builds. And the trick to that is to... Um, it's complicated, but it, 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 it sounds complicated. It's really simple. With the amp fully discharged, remove the three screws typically that hold the, the, the board in place. And if you fiddle with the uh, the wires on uh, the left side, if you're looking at the amp upside down into the chassis with the knobs away from you, if you slide the board to the left, the, the bottom board should slide all the way out of the amp. Take that board and basically soak it in isopropyl alcohol. You want to drive out any moisture contaminants in that. And then you want to get uh, some paper towels and slide them from whichever way you can so they're between the main board and the chassis. And then you remove solder from uh, all the joints that either have high DC on them, so that's your B-plus nodes and your plate connections, and anything that carries grid, which is really adjacent to, the, to that, where the uh, conductive uh, path is being formed from the high DC area. And get all that solder out and then soak all that in isopropyl and then heat up all those eyelets uh, with a soldering iron. And it'll drive the isopropyl away and that'll push the moisture out. And any stuff that's on the bottom of the board will, will kind of wick out into that paper towel. Then you remove that paper towel and you get some plastic uh, or wooden uh, chopsticks or whatever and kind of prop the main board up so there's air between it and the, and the and the chassis and you let it air dry you let it air dry for like an hour then you slide the bottom board back in place you screw it back in place and then you re-solder all the things where you remove solder and 99.99 something percent of the time mostly that does the trick because you've probably got just some moisture and contaminants built up in that board since 1962, and that's how you give it a fresh, clean start. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, Chris, I, ha I had a TC, I didn't remember that was the model number, but I've, I've, I don't have the, schem the full schematic for it, and I, or if I did, I've forgotten, I apologize. Um, it was an app, I'm like, oh, that's, that's terrible, but I didn't devote any more... Uh, little gray cells to that. Uh, yeah, I've got experience uh, with parallel single ended amps, and not just the champ, but all the variations and super champs and stuff with parallel. I I don't like it. I I think it's a, a pointless exercise. Class A B is just vastly superior to Class A, especially when you're talking single ended Class A. Um, uh, direct feel. I don't th think it's direct fuel. I think it's, it's uh, well, that's subjective. And if you like it, that's great. And go for it. Subjectively, 
I don't find it worthwhile. Objectively, it seems like you're spending as much money as or more than it takes to get uh, class A, B, and you've got so much more issue dealing with with, with uh, Ripple and, and Hum in general with the single-ended. And the louder you make it, because you're paralleling tubes, the more audible that noise will be. And there's a reason the entire industry said, all right, to a certain point, we're doing single-ended class A. After that, everything's uh, class A, B. Let's see. If I try to correct nut bow at the 12th fret area by tightening the truss rod, the neck creates back bow between nut and 4th fret where neck is thinner. What to do? Where neck is thinner. Huh. If you've got that happening... You've got a, a very problematic uh, neck. Um, I don't. I'm not sure that you have a problem with neck bow at the 12th fret area, though. You probably, probably have what we call ramping, where what we think of it is is that the neck's here and then here at the heel, it goes up, and so you fret out there and you think that's bow. What it really is, is that the, the neck, instead of bowing in a curve, bows at a curve starting pretty much around the where the neck goes from thicker to thinner, right like the 13th or 12th fret on most electric guitar necks. So it maintains its original angle uh, on the upper part, and then right about the 13th fret, that's when it begins to flex. And so all the, the bow is there, uh, and the fix for that is typically to just uh, lower the frets in the ramped portion to, to, to have it fall away. And if you take it to a, a good guitar tech, they can see if that's the proper course of action or whether you actually do have a problem with your neck. Um, but depending on the price of your guitar, if you actually have a problem where you have the neck moving just between the nut and the fourth fret and not the rest of the neck, yeah, that might be a, a binner. Hey, Jeffrey Soper. Sorry if I missed that. Yeah, if you've got a Hot Rod Deluxe, I've put this in videos. Change V1. I wouldn't do a 12A a Y7 for V1. I, I, you can. Um, uh, but actually, actually, no. The, the, a 12A Y makes sense in, the, in, in, the, in that. I, 5751 would be my first call, of my first try. But a 12A Y7 there and then an AT in the phase inverter. That combination will give you a lot of a better sound. Um, I think the 5751 does the, the job um uh but uh, yeah a 12 ay will not hurt i think i might have even put a video out showing a 12 ay so if it seems like i'm contradicting myself um uh, that's very very possible i don't remember everything that i say but i mean it every time uh don't change uh, V3 to a 12 AT7. Yeah, V3. Uh, sorry, I was thinking other fenders. V3 in the in there is is a uh, is a, the phase inverter and V3 as a 12 AT7. You're gonna get a little more headroom and a, a nicer sound, really. Yeah, sometimes the control panel will, uh, will get a little bit warm around the the transformers on a twin reverb or other larger offenders, um, the power transformer gets warm. Um, and that can eventually warm up the chassis, which warms up the metal faceplate. Uh, if it's just warm to the touch, there's nothing to be concerned about. Uh, F F Fountain Bird, Quine, I don't know if Mondi's caps are good, or I, th I imagine they're fine, but this, it's just going to be a different graphic. Um, they're a, a small pickup manufacturer in England for the rest of you. Um, and you can make pickups out of your house. You cannot make capacitors out of your house. You cannot make capacitors out of any small business. And no small business is making capacitors. You have to have a, a big factory. So if Monty's having a factory make some, some caps with their graphic on them, I guess there's a market for that. Depending on what they cost, are they any good? Depends on what they are underneath the logo, if you like the sound of it. Um, I wouldn't pay more than $7 for a guitar capacitor. And I, the ones I typically reach for are three dollars down to like fifty cents. Uh, and th th they don't say Monty's, and they don't they don't say any guitar manufacturer's brand on them. 
Um, but you know, uh, there are people who want want the assurance of of brand loyal loyalty. So certain brands, and Monty sounds like one that have, you know they kind of. Uh, expand their product line sometimes is just with uh, graphics. I have not had the S AC30 S1 yet. I have a suspicion that it shares a lot in common with AC10 uh, C series as far as the construction. I hope that it does not have the same weaknesses, but I have not had one in. If you're liking it, that's great. Uh, the 60s Vintage Showman is great. It's it's a twin without refurb. Um, I think it's a, a fantastic amp. Uh, nothing, not a damn thing wrong with it. Uh, they kind of um, uh, they're kind of not embraced by all the pop and country guys the way the reverb amps were, and you know the head only version like that. Um, Marshall kind of stole their thunder in the rock and, and the beginnings of the, the hard rock scene. I know that the Showman was used a lot, though, uh, with some of the West Coast bands and the and the whole uh, San Francisco scene and what it turned into with the Dead and all that. Let's see. He bought a preamp that sounds great but behaves badly. Hey, Lauren, as I turn the the pots. The mid spot towards 10, it increases up to about 6, and it starts cutting mids to nothing between 7 and 10. What might this be? Uh, I think you've got a bad pot. I think uh, the pot uh, wiper is separating, is lifting off of the track. That's the most likely thing, unless it's some very strange design with an active EQ, uh, which is rare. Uh, so um, I would suspect you have a, a bum pot. It's a shame, you know, People form opinions of entire amps based on that. I don't know what amp it is that you have, but you can have a really well-designed amp and a $3 pot that worked fine in testing six months later has this problem. Um, uh, to a degree, that's like saying, I love that car, but the headlight burned out, and I don't like it. You know, I'm not saying that you're like that, but it's like a head, headlight bulb in a car, you know, pots are, uh, or tires, if you have maybe a better analogy. It's, it's you know. That that's an easy fix, though, unless it's something where it's PCB and you got to pull eighteen million things to to get to it. Hey, guitar man, appreciate you. Um, I've not any experience with the Fried, Friedman small box. Um, pop due to feedback loop. Uh, okay, I think. Well. If, if, if you're talking about, are you, t I don't have, I've not had that amp in. I don't know what, what Dave's doing in that. I don't know whether it's uh, two different jacks like you'd find on a JCM 800 or if it's a switch. Uh, I'm sure that it is possible to do something about it. I'm not sure if it's worth doing something about it. If it is normal, uh, sometimes people will just tell you, uh, hit and put it in standby before you do that. Uh, contact Dave because he will have a certain degree of experience with that amp and he'll take he'll take care of you. Um, but I don't I don't know. And uh, I, my inclination is sometime, sometimes in order to get a feature without raising the price a lot, you will do it the simplest way to do it, even if that has a downside like a, a, a known issue, popping issue. Sometimes it's unavoidable because the fix for that is to put in... Uh, uh, a muting circuit. So at the moment of switching, it mutes, but that can add a lot of complexity. You may have to add a separate power supply to, to, to start doing that kind of stuff. Just a second. I've, I've got to hit a, a button on my camera. This crosshair thing is driving me nuts. There we go. Much better. So there are trade-offs we make as designers. Like, yes, it would be nice if, but I don't want to raise the price. And, you know, people will learn, oh, it, doc, doc, it hurts when I do that. Don't do that. Hey, DB, car amps are re really well made. I think they're over-enthusiastic over with their uh, use of silicone goop. It's not goop, but, you know, silicone everywhere. Um, but overall, they're really well well built, and they sound great. I... I um, 
I mean, I from looking at the speaker emulation reactive load kind of thing that they do, it's got an actual voice coil in those models, and I, I worry that that voice coil may not be sufficient, but I have had no experience with that voice coil failing. It just looks a little bit optimistic to me. So it's something I would keep an eye on, but it would not dissuade, it would not make me tell someone don't buy one. Um, I'm just being honest, cards on the table, I look at that design, I think that voice coil could be heftier, but not all cars have that option. Um, if it sounds good to you, I'll let you know that underneath the hood, it is good. Yeah, Dave told me that um, he he intentionally biases the runs really hot. The one I had here was was running about 14 watts, and I did not change it. So uh, it's kind of very based on tubes. Uh, I am, um, if, if I had, if I had known that on the one that I had, I would have mentioned that I only had the one run 20 in. and if I get another win, I'll, another one in, I'll, I'll show where, where to change that. Um, I don't like running that high on, on, uh, on cathode bias steel 84s. Dave apparently does. Um, there's also the warranty voiding issue. I tend to go 14 Watts max. Uh, which is about where Vox set theirs. And I don't think you get any tonal advantage going over 14 watts, but there are longevity issues that come in um, and red plating issues, etc. cetera. Uh, so if you were to change that, it'd be a very simple change, but I don't want to t tell you to void your warranty. Um, it's fun, isn't it? Uh, but uh, you have to watch your wall voltage too, because if, if Dave sets that, to be over by a certain amount uh, at 120 volts, and then you've got 127 volts coming out of your wall, then you're even higher than what Dave pushed it to. So um, it's an easy thing to change, but I'm not going to tell you to void your warranty by making that change here. Uh, hey, Chris McKinney, your reverb hums at anything above three? It should not. It should not uh, hum at all. Um, and it's a sixty-six. Uh, something's up with your reverb circuit. Uh, and uh, see my videos on this, where you can actually use the uh, reverb send RCA jack as a speaker out. If you have a little, you get a little uh, RCA to quarter inch adapter. And run it out into an uh, eight ohm cab, and you can listen to just what's coming uh, out of the transformer send, to the, which be going to the tank. See if you have hum there. If you have hum there, you probably have a, or might at least have a bad uh, reverb driver transformer. But you should not have hum. You can also uh, mute uh, the input of the reverb using your foot, the foot switch. The, you know, the return of the reverb, and then turn the reverb up. And if you have hum there, then it's in the re return stage. But uh, the hum should not be there. Uh, new old stock Russian valves are all over the map, Tim. It, uh, it's like a lot of things. Buy the vendor, not the product. So find a tube vendor that you have can have a relationship with and ask them what they have in stock, that's good. Uh, and if they have some Russian tubes that they've gone through and tested and they, they stand behind, that's one thing. But if you buy them off eBay, et cetera, et cetera, you don't know what you're getting. All right. Uh, hey, Tristan. Uh, I already answered the question on the control plate on the twin. Um, I'd ask everyone, please, to only ask questions once because it um, it does make it hard to get through uh, to everything. I've got to sort through. And also, uh, if you could put a question mark, or I guess th ideally would be three question marks in a space before a question, so I can see when someone's asking me a question versus talking to each other. And I love it that you guys talk to each other. It's great.
Hey, uh, Jeff asks, hi, are standby switches necessary on a tube amplifier? Thanks in advance. There's not a simple answer to this. I've done videos on this. Uh, if you have an amp with solid state rectification, use the standby switch. Just just use it if you have an amp with solid state rectification. Uh, if you have an amp with a tube rectifier, generally you don't need to use the, the, the uh, standby switch. Um, that's the best way to put this. Unless someone has told you specifically not to use it on a, on a certain model, though, it's usually safe to use, but like specifically, if you have a Vox AC Custom Class, AC30 Custom Classic, don't use standby. The way they did it damages the rectifier tube. Other similar apps from, from the user's perspective that have a tube rectifier, it won't hurt to use this, the standby switch. It's just not necessary at all. If you have an amp with a solid state rectifier, go ahead and use the standby switch because unless you're a tech and you know what everything inside is, how, what everything inside is, you won't know from the outside. Um, and you, and people always ask us, you never, standby is only ever used when powering the amp on. You don't need to use it when you're powering the amp off. You can just turn the amp off. Unless you get a pop when you turn it off, in which case you may want to go to standby first. Uh, but sometimes going to standby makes a, a pop and, and turning it off doesn't. So, you know, it's fun. Hey, Clark Blacker, his 64 Super Reverb is starting losing signal in both channels erratically from crackles to a few seconds. Any thoughts? That could be a lot of things, man. That could be a lot of things. Um, I, I can't diagnose just from that, from the distance. That could be bad tubes. That could be old uh, cathode bypass caps. It could be bad filter caps. It could be uh, a solder joint, which is partially disconnected. Um, uh, there are a lot of possible causes, but you need to take your amp to a tech. Okay, uh, JJ's House of Jams has a 68 Princeton non reverb, still, still clean and untouched, still has a two um, prong cord, sounds perfect in a noise form. My recommendations are 1968, that's older than I am, and look at me. At the very least, you you have to get the power cable replaced. Uh, it's not a, uh, you you have a higher noise floor with a two two prong than you think. You just won't know the difference until you, you have a three prong, and it is uh, not safe because you are depending on the position of that switch as to whether that chassis has 120 volts potential between it, it and ground, which means that when you're holding your guitar, you would have that potential between yourself and say a microphone on stage. At the very least, get the power cord replaced. And honestly, there's no magic in those old caps. I'm, I'm glad it sounds great to you now. It's going to sound even better and not have anything blow up if the caps are changed. Uh, electrolytic caps are not designed to last 60 years um, or 50, what, 55 years, 56, you know, 56 years, whatever the amp is now. So my re recommendation is to have it fully recapped. Uh, it will do no harm, and it can only be good. But at the, you must, must change out the power cable if you're ever going to use that outside your house. I know people will argue with that, but, uh, you know. I am very picky about speakers because that's the entire thing, you know. It's like it um, doesn't matter how good the movie is if your glasses are bad, uh, you know, if you need a new prescription. Uh, how everything we do with the guitar, everything we do with the amp, everything we're trying to do comes to a speaker. What would I recommend for a 63 uh, Vibrolux circuit? Uh, I, I have tried the Eminent Alessandros. Those are great. Um, uh, a 2x10, uh, I love the Warehouse G10 uh, Cs. I think the Eminent Alessandros are great. They're, they've been out of stock for a long time. Hopefully they're back in stock. I like the ET10s. I like the uh, another great combination for that amp is a pair of the uh, 10 inch Celestian Gold, so that's the most expensive. Uh, but they're all going to sound different. And so at that point, 
they're all different flavors of good, but I can't choose your favorite flavor of ice cream. And it, you know, it sounds silly, but it really is that. It's like choosing what someone else is going to like is impossible. I can say that, hey, this one's made with better ingredients than that one. Uh, but, you know, and of the ones we, we just listed, including the eminence, those are all good choices. Uh, Alex G, uh, DSL t- uh, 2000. Uh, yeah, well, it sounds like you've pretty much done it. You've gone f- overboard, actually, if you added the choke. Um, um, it, it is what it is, and it is a time capsule kind of amp, a time capsule kind of sound, and I don't think you're going to have any success making it something different than that. Uh, if you want a different sound, get other amps as well. Uh, but if you have a JCM 2000 DSL that no longer catches on fire, you're ahead of the pack. Uh, so enjoy that for those sounds and get other things for other sounds because it is not a uh, it is not a sonic chameleon, and it it has its strengths and has its weaknesses. But the way that thing is built, yeah, I or many other techs could could mod it, but. It would not be our ideal modding platform. Uh, there are a lot of decisions in that amp that are just kind of baked in in a way that any real substantive changes would end up in, with some Rube Goldberg hybrid that no one would be truly happy with. Uh, hey, Fountainberg, I know AC15 custom head kind of sound entirely different than a vibro champ uh i would be concerned depending on the speaker in your vibro champ that uh that, that um they wouldn't have the wattage to handle the ac15 which is about four times more than the vibro champ output um but you know the uh and you're going to lose a lot of what the ac15 is doing if you go into a, a little eight inch speaker but you may love it. But no, the amp itself is going to sound radically different than VibroChamp. VibroChamp is a very, very clean, clean sound. And I like the sound of a VibroChamp. Um, AC15 does beautiful clean, but then it's got a lot of other tricks up its sleeve. <laughs> hey, VR. I've not had a lot of experience with angles. Uh, I don't know whether it's that people in America in, in general don't, don't buy them as much as they do in other parts of the world, or whether it's um, specific to this region, the, the mid south, where it's just not very been very popular. Maybe they, maybe they just haven't had a dealer uh, network, or maybe they just never fail, and that's why I have not seen them. But uh, I've not run into many Ingles. I do know that uh, other texts have, and opinions of Ingles from other texts are not universally favorable. Let's just say it that way. But I don't have any uh, uh, opinion myself. Hey, Daniel. Yeah, you'll probably be okay. Um, he just got the, the, the new Sweetwater Tweed Princeton reissue, and he's in love with it. It's great. It's a good sounding app. He wants to know if, if, I, if I think he should take it to his tech now to have the reliability upgrades I've talked about or wait for the warranty to expire. I say wait for the warranty to expire because you're unlikely to suffer any I- of the issues that I address with those upgrades within two years. And if you do, it's under warranty. Uh, But uh, as soon as that warranty is up, yeah, have that done because you don't want it to last six months past the warranty. You want it to be around for a couple of decades at least. And um, not a thing that I suggest in in those reliability upgrades changes the the fundamental sound, Uh, but it sure makes it sound that way a lot longer. The uh, Princeton reissue 65, that is, not the, not the 68, but the 65 reissue Princeton, like all the other 65 reissue series, are really good apps. They just need a little help getting over the finish line. Oh, Christopher, I'm sorry. I, I don't remember. Um, I don't remember uh, TC versus Mesa 55. Um Neither of those companies would be my choices for power amps. 
but I'm not, I don't keep up with the modern tiny class D amp world. So uh, there's probably something much better than TC, but I don't know what, I don't know specifically what to point you to. Hey, OK, Belf. Um, his a year old mono price app start sound start dark in any setting lost some output time for new tubes most likely i um i'm not a big fan of mono price i think that they are way over promising at the price that they sell and there you know there's a they're basically selling a free lunch i'm glad it's work has been working for you and i imagine that you're some tubes away from it working for a while longer but I would not put too much money into keeping that thing going when it when it does begin to fail it any repair would quickly exceed its value and that's the just the, the sad reality of the mono price stuff but uh, uh, you know if you have access to some 12x7s see if it's just one 12x7 you may be $25 away from a, a functioning app because one of the things with the mono price stuff is it's going to come with the cheapest of the cheap, the most generic of the generic, and they just don't tend to last very long. All pr current production tubes are kind of a gamble, um, regardless regardless of price or brand, but the little one, the little generics especially. Hey there, Derek. Appreciate you, man. Awesome. Oh, I will. I will enjoy it. Uh, uh, if you see me just with orange all over my face, you'll know I've been to pains. Good, Vinicius. Dengue fever. Oof. Let's see. Thanks, VR. Appreciate that. Um, sorry, I don't have any real opinion about Ingle to share, but maybe one will come in and I'll be able to do so. Um, but uh, uh, you know, if I get an Ingle, I'll put put it on the channel just for you. Hey Brian Landers, if you've emailed me, I will get to you. Uh, I am I am constantly playing p uh, catch up on, on emails. I'm sorry, I'm just one guy. Uh, uh, it's not from disinterest or snobbery or anything. I just uh, I have I have the um, public response of a larger company, and it's just me. And I I, I mean that I'm not as a uh, egotistical the way you know in some ways this channel has been very successful and has led to a lot of opportunities but um you know i'm just one guy and uh i'm you know i, I will get to it i appreciate you thanks okay belf appreciate that for the pickup fund very nice uh hey lefty mike i'm not a fan of the base breaker apps uh especially the ones um which have um the uh, auto bias circuit. The auto bias circuits break down and becomes a very expensive repair uh, and a very complicated uh, solution in search of a problem because for decades and decades, a very simple bias circuit made up of like six inexpensive components has worked for everything from a Princeton to a Marshall Major. Uh, but no, Fender had to come up with a very clever auto bias circuit which burns itself up. And then the end user has a big repair bill. I will say that I've got a good a good friend up in Brooklyn who's a fantastic player. He's got one, I think, the 15 watt. He says the sound is great, and he would know, but I've not had the model that he has. But I also know that if his dies, not to talk about his finances, he can afford to go out and buy something else. But if you're saving up, and that's going to be your amp, and that's you know something you've got to decide versus other things or you know or i'm gonna not go out to eat for two months so i can get this thing i think you need to know that it's it's really not well built and won't will not last Ooh, any reason he shouldn't remove the ground switch from our three prong mason mark three and repurpose that spot for a separate r2 volume pot uh, 
uh, the the ground switch is is a leftover from from uh, Mesa copying old fenders. Um, in theory, if you were to play a place that does not have a grounded power outlet, that would allow you to make the chassis quieter with a non-grounded power outlet. The reality is that if you go to a place and the power outlet is not grounded, don't play there. They're not up to modern safety codes and they don't give a shit about the, the, the musicians who play on that stage. All musicians should refuse to play any place that does not have safe power. So uh, I can't tell you whether to put a, a volume pot there, though. Uh, you might have uh, ground switches or a, 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 a larger hole size than a pot takes. You can get some wonky stuff, and I don't know whether you want to uh, be moving any audio into that area over by the AC main. So there are reasons not to. And just in terms of where that volume pot would be located physically. Because uh, you don't want preamp stuff over by the AC main stuff. But uh, there's no reason to retain the, the ground switch. Uh, the nice, only good thing about the ground switch on Mesa's and, and uh, PV5150s is that they usually have a centered position where it's not connected. So you're not going to have a cap failure that shorts out. I have no experience with car uh, bell ray DB, but I, all the cars I have had in have been very well built, if overbuilt. Greetings, Mr. Triple O. What is your opinion on Muller 12AX7 and EL34 tubes? I'm looking at their 12AX7 because they are long plate. What would you buy? Money not being an obstacle. Thank you. Um, I hope that came through on the other end for you guys to hear that. Uh, long plate is good and bad in a combo channel. Uh, in a so not channel in a combo amp, a uh, long plate can be microphonic, and so sometimes that's best avoided. In a head, you have more leeway with that. Uh, I, I've in general have enjoyed the Mullard reissue AX7 and EL34 tubes. Um, there have been some issues getting them and then they're towards you know the beginning of the process a lot of what we were able to get what were kind of the dregs because you know the embargoes and stuff but um uh i've had no no uh i've had a couple of bad ones but i've, I've had some really good experiences with mullard x7 and 34s uh, i would not use a, a um necessarily in a fender combo because it can be microphonic and because there can be a uh, bleed on the shared cathode. I don't know why it's, I found that in the mullards and I found that in the tongue saw, which are made in the same factory. Uh, but they're one of my first choices for Marshalls. And they're one of my first choices for Voxes. And the EL34s have been great. Let's see. Matt Fields is saying the same thing about, uh, Signal wires near the AC line, yeah. It's it's just a thing. And Seth B, um, yeah, uh, Champ 12, or I can't keep up with all the variations that, that uh, Fender did, but when I, I'm not talking about uh, the Champ 12 and Champ 24 or any of that stuff. Um, uh, the the champ twos and all that stuff the um but i have played around with some uh single-ended amps that use parallel uh single-ended tubes uh, it is a way to do it uh, i just don't think it's a uh, a way that i would ever choose uh 60s and 70s svts are hard to work on they're easier to work on than 80s and 90s and current production svts but um, you know, it's not just the weight, though the weight is substantial and picking a 80 pound thing up and turning it over on your bench. is not for everyone. Uh, the multi pin connectors between the, the preamp box and the power amp box, 
those wires like to break, and the ground wire likes to break if you look at it too hard. It's got some weird floating ground things going in it. It's got extraordinarily high voltage presence, so if you if you get your ground wrong, you can find out, or your estate will. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, large resistors on the on the main board and the power amp uh, board that like to burn, and and diodes that get too hot. Uh, and it was a very, very flimsy design, a kind of a, uh, the foil is just kind of, it's, it's kind of like a foil applied on, on, the, uh, on the fiberglass as opposed to an actual thick layer of, 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 uh, of uh, copper. It's, there are challenges, and those challenges are compounded by the weight, the size, how dirty they can get and uh, how much they want to kill you and are capable of doing so very quickly. What am I doing with the drama comp behind me? Well, I, uh, it came in, there's gonna be a video on this once I set up to test it. It came in when I power on and I found it's because the uh, can't find my pointer. The mains fuse had broken, and it looked like it was physically there, but it had snapped, and so it was just pushing out. So I replaced the mains fuse holder, and I replaced the HT fuse holder. I'm calling it the HT fuse holder because it's, it's its function, though it's only 50 milliamps, uh, just so that the two of them would match, because when it comes to gear like drummer, you want things to match. And it came in without the fuse for the tube heaters. So the owner's complaint that it did not power on and could not get sound were very true. So it has got uh, two new fuse holders and three new fuses and it powered right up and then it was time to do this. So I just got the, the snapshot at the beginning of the process that I use for the thumbnail for this. And this afternoon after this, I'm gonna hook up some microphones, uh, XLR stuff and make sure that all the channels are working. But yeah, it's, it's, it's analog, it's tube, it belongs here just like all the other stuff. Let's see. On an all tube amp like a Super Reverb or Marshall JTM5, what is better for the amp? Post phase inverter master vo volume or a, a soaker attenuators? The master volume always, because if you're using a, an attenuator on the speaker, the output tubes will be working harder and harder as, as you know, and you, especially if you keep turning the attenuator down to get more and more out of the amp at a lower vo volume. Whereas if you have a master volume, you're eliminating everything. Uh, after the phase inverter, so the output tubes don't work harder at lower volumes. There are sonic trade-offs to each. The, probably the best solution would be to use a master volume down to maybe 2 o'clock and an attenuator down to maybe 8 dB, but not 12 dB, or maybe just 6 dB. So you have 6 dB of attenuation from, a, from an attenuator, and you may have 6 dB attenuation from a master volume, neither one of which has much of a sonic fingerprint in itself at those settings, and together you end up with 12 dB of fairly transparent uh, uh, volume uh, lowering. The amp is running cooler, but only a little bit cooler. Uh, you're not gonna have all the artifacts. Then you're just left with, are the speakers moving enough? Are they efficient enough to move at, at the lower volume? And uh, is it at a level where we still hear it correctly? Look up Fletcher Munson curves because you can turn it down and you think that, oh my God, that lost all its low end, it lost all its highs, it's real boxy. That's, um, that's not the amp failing, that's how we hear those same sounds at low volume. It gets complicated. Let's see. Looking to extend the speaker cable length for my, com my combo amp so I can run ahead into the, the combo speaker amp. S soldering a longer speaker cable to the speaker. I use an adapter. Okay, I use a coupler adapter all the time. So, um, no, 
I can show you. I use a I use a twenty foot eighteen gauge or sixteen gauge. Sorry, twenty foot eight sixteen gauge speaker cable. So every time you see a head up on the on the bench or a combo where I have the the chassis out, I'm running out. I'm either running to my shop cab or I'll be running to the combo itself. Um, its speakers using a, a a Switchcraft quarter inch female female adapter. Do I have that handy? I think it's in the back of one of the amps over there right now, actually. But uh, yeah, so I just use the adapter. Uh, I, I, there's no downside to it. Hey, Louis Delalo, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. I don't know uh, an app tech in Montreal. Uh, I have a, a good friend in. Um, uh, just outside of uh, uh, Toronto, um, he's in um, Chris Church at Church Audio. Um, can't remember the name of the little town. He's, he's in a suburb of Toronto, the same place that Neil Peart's from. Uh, same same town that uh, our buddy um, uh, Ted Woodford lives in. I can't think of the name of that little town now. So I've got a Toronto guy. I don't have I don't have a Montreal guy for you. Je suis désolé. Uh, do I prefer combo or head and, ca and cab? It depends on on the on the uh, on the uh, the whole thing. I you know I don't want a deluxe reverb sound out of a four by ten or four by twelve. Um, in general, up to a certain wattage, it matters too. Like uh, up to thirty watts, combo is very convenient. Uh, at some point. You may say, oh, I'll get a head, and I can have a 2x12 for this gig, and then a 4x12 for this other gig, and that way uh, the load-in is a lot easier. Uh, you know, in a Marshall sound, I most Marshall sounds, I prefer a head with a, with a cabinet separate, but I also love a JTM45 in a bluesbreaker format, which has a very different response. So I guess the real answer is we all need to have as many amps as possible. That's what I tell myself. That's what I tell my wife. Anyway, I, I say that as a joke. I actually don't own any amps myself because I don't. Where would I put them? When would I have time to use them? I, I have other people's amps here all the time. Uh, would a crank deluxe or a Princeton with a PAF approximate the Husker Du thing at a more normal volumes? Well, yeah. Um, Husker Du, you get yourself a V and. Uh, the cheapest uh, beatest up pedal you can get, and you run into either a JC Mate Hundred or a Twin, and you be loud and you play fast, um, and then you know get your hearing checked. Uh, so I, th I think you'd probably be better off with a, a Deluxe than a Princeton. And uh, while you can just turn the amp up, I think you'd be happier if you use an overdrive pedal. Uh, speaking as a Husker Du fan, I imagine that if you were to just get uh, a Gibson S guitar with the with humbuckers of some stripe that makes you happy, and a Rat pedal and a Deluxe reverb, you're golden, and the rest is up to your right hand. Anything anything else would make no sense. Uh, so is there a fairly simple mod to do on a Princeton to get a longer decay like a super or twin? The reverb circuit's exactly the same on the Princeton, the twin, and the uh, and, and the super. Uh, reverb tanks come in different uh, 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 decay lengths, and you can get a two-spring or a three-spring with either decay length. So if you're looking for more reverb, you may want to get a long decay three-spring. Uh, most fenders from the 60s had a two-spring tank. Um, um, and in general, the current production medium decays sound more like the 60s long decays. So if you want the sound of a, say, a 66 Super Reverb, I would say get a two-spring medium decay tank currently. But if you're looking for wet, 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 get a three-spring long decay. They know that they can sound a little bit darker, but... Uh, um, you know, they're 25 to $40 each. You know, it's a pretty easy thing to experiment with. 
But the circuit itself uh, of the Princeton Reverb, the Reverb circuit is exactly the same as you'd find on the on the larger amps. Thank you, uh, Maki B. All right, we're just a little bit over one hour, and my teeth are swimming. We're going to take a seven-minute break, and then we'll get to uh, John L's questions about compression and rectifier tubes and all that fun stuff. So we're going to do a seven-minute break, and I'll see you guys back shortly.
right, we are back. Let's see. And we are here with John L.'s question. He doesn't like the compression of the 5Y3 rectifier, higher volume, so he tried GC34, 5 4 Yeah, you're going to get mosquito-like fizz if the notes decay because uh, that's way too much. Uh, um, you're going to have a much, much higher uh, B+. Plus without, unless you also change the bias. Uh, a 5F1 amp is supposed to have compression. Um, I don't think that you're, I mean this nicely, I don't think you're approaching it from the right perspective. The 5F1 is supposed to have a, do a certain thing and have certain limitations and, and um, create, you know, it could be artistic. Creativity needs parameters. So it doesn't matter if you can do anything if everything is easily done um uh, so i think you would find uh with the lower voltage drop of the other tubes and the and, and the solid states especially uh you're p trying to push the amp into being something that it really is not is not um and uh you would have to you're not going to be in the good bias range with those other rectifiers i would go back to the 5y3 and then play around Play around with speakers. You may uh, be up against the limitation of the speaker that you have, and I don't know what that is. But it could just be that the five F one is not for you. It, 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 you know, they are charming little things, but they were designed to be student apps, practice apps. And Fender wanted you to be dissatisfied with one the moment you heard your buddy's deluxe or your buddy's super or your buddy's basement, etc. Hey Brian, I'm not working through Martin anymore. We're still great friends, but uh, um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm becoming a little more selective about what I work on, and, and I, uh, and, you know, it's um, uh, so. Contact me, and I'll look for your email uh, info at sonicaudio.com. Hey Maki B, he got a DRI based on my recommendation. Best decision ever. I'm glad it worked out well for you. They're they're good good amps. They're not perfect. But you know they are they are quite good and can be made that much closer to uh, perfect with those longevity mods. I don't like the stock speaker in most deluxe reverb issues, but that's easily changed. Yeah, the fifty one fifty and the dual rectifier are both based on the SLO. Um, there's some changes. Um, they don't sound identical. I don't think they sound as good. They're certainly not, they're not as well built. Um, but they, they, they share the same common concept of, of, of how the gain is derived. Um, you know, people will say, no, they're totally different, blah, blah, blah. No, you don't use the 39K cold clipper stage unless you've been looking directly at the SLO. And if you look at the, all the schematics, you have to redraw some of the schematics so that they're legible. But if you look at the schematics and squint a little bit, all the variations disappear. You see pretty much the same sequence of stuff happening. Uh, with minor tweaks. There are things where the Soldano cleans kind of blended with the dirty and uh, the effects loops in a different place. Um, but in general, you know, it's a Marshall is a, is a baseman. Yeah. And there are differences. And as time went on, those differences got greater and greater. With the 5150 and, and the dual rectifier and the SLO, the differences are not as great as the differences between, say, a 58 baseman and a uh, 68 plexi, um, you know, say, super lead. Let's see. Hey, yeah, uh, uh, thoughts on the tonal impacts of swapping tubes in V1? Um, sometimes you'll hear it. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes we trick ourselves into hearing differences. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to tell. There are times when I'll have an amp that's just anemic and I change the preamp tube and the amp is transformed. But that's rarely that because I went from JJ to some other brand or anything like that. It's usually that, okay, this amp had a, a 
a, a tube that was weak, I put in a tube that was operating within normal spec, and hey, it sounds better. Uh, there are also been t- sometimes when hey, yeah, this this the gains there, but it just sounds a little dark, and this other one just has this little bit of air. You're not going to hear it in every amp in every position. I had a uh, AC fifteen C one in here a couple weeks ago, and it had some Tube Store Preferred series uh, seventy twenty five tubes in it which are usually fantastic tubes. These were about three or four years old. Of the three, two of them were very, very weak. The entire amp sounded anemic. I changed those out for just, you know, pretty much the cheapest good thing on the market, which is the JJ ECC 83s, and the amp came alive. And it was not because Tube Store Preferred Series are not as good as JJ's. It's those Tube Store Preferred Series which are, uh, had were, were very well sorted Russian, I mean, uh, Chinese tubes. They just had lost their their mojo over the years. They they were putting out less and less gain, and the JJs were right in spec. I've had uh, some some Marshalls from the seventies uh, in here, where um, it might have had an old Brymar or, uh, or or Mullard or Bugle Boy in there. It sounded okay, but it just something was a little bit off i'd either put in a different new old stock tube that the owner provided or a modern muller reissue and hey it came to life and it's some it's there are a lot of variables not all of which correlate to price but uh if you hear it you may very well hear a difference whether that's an improvement or not is up to you but sometimes we can trick ourselves we will often find that the more we spend on a tube the more we like the, the sound of the tube and that's just to uh that's just human nature uh guitar man you need i i don't i don't know how loud the pop is if it's to the level you worry about your speakers contact dave he stands behind his products but i don't i don't have any experience with uh was it the dirty sister you said i i don't recall i'm sorry I have a 2010 Fender Blues Deluxe reissue with issues. DB says, "Should I throw it on the bonfire?" Well, I think I, I think you've asked this in other chats, and I've answered. Uh, you don't need to throw it on a, on, a, on a bonfire; it'll start its own eventually. Um, I have multiple videos on the Blues Deluxe, the Deluxe, uh, the Hot Rod Deluxe, all those series on the channel, showing why they fail, how to fix them. But the typical repair for one of those is three hundred to four hundred dollars. So it's up to you whether it's worth it. If you get it back in running shape, it's going to be what it always was, which is a pretty good clean channel and a pretty nasty sounding distortion channel. Um, but if that does it for you, it, they're, they're usually fixable unless uh, the uh, heat issues have developed point, to the point where the board is just charred and the pads are, and the traces are gone. That's usually less of an issue with the Blues Deluxe uh, than it is with the Hot Rod. The Hot Rods run hotter in general. Hey, Jason uh, Ra, or uh, I apologize. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your last name correctly. Uh, which Vichy series ceramic disc caps do I prefer? I like the 562R series and the 561 and then a few others. I use one kilovolts whenever possible. I don't worry about the tolerance so much. Ten uh, percent is usually just fine, but if if I have a cap where everything else is where I want, and it's twenty percent, that's usually fine as well. Honestly, the way that we use uh, small value caps and amplifiers, twenty percent tolerance is fine. You're not going to hear. Oh, I wanted a, a, a high pass at a, at a one point. 2k but that's clearly 1.1k we just don't hear that way um there's so much overlap it's not like it's hard and fast and there's just shelves everything directly beneath it there's a fall off you know so i'm not making fun of you with that voice i'm but i'm making fun of myself because when i was younger and and learning about this i was so focused on exactly controlling frequencies and 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 high pass uh centers must be exactly here and it some to to a degree that kind of stuff doesn't matter um you know i was tuning a mini moog not a mini moog a moog prodigy yesterday calibrating it and it, it was interesting because that's an actual pitch thing that 
you know, like uh, I'd be targeting, say, 394.7 hertz. I don't remember what it was. That was the goal. And I could hear, I'm, 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 uh, because it was very, the trim pots were very sensitive and it's really easy to overshoot. And I had it hooked up to my meter so I could see the actual frequency coming out. But I could hear when I was just like, Two tenths of a, of, a, of a hertz flat, or three tenths of a, of a hertz sharp. Um, that doesn't apply when it comes to small value cap uh, values like this. Nice Ferris reference there, JDS. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about the little sister. I just haven't had a chance to try one yet. I'm glad it's working out for you. Oh, Andy, I would not use a Hot Rod Deluxe uh, to stick it out to build a different amp out of. Uh, the, the way the, the holes in the chassis are done for the tubes makes it very difficult to put socketed chassis mounted tubes in it. You're pretty much going to have a lot of workarounds to get it to work. Practice on, on the old Deluxe to practice working on PCBs, but I would get something else. I mean, you can get a, a a chassis for like seventy bucks from Mojo Tone. You can get a combo cabinet for like three hundred to four hundred. Uh, I would I would if you're gonna build an amp, I would start with a better platform than the old shell of a Hot Rod Deluxe. Pardon me. It's just just a lot of things about the way that thing is physically laid out that make it tricky to implement uh, other things. I'm sure there's a way around it, but. You, you you would need different opening sizes for for all your tubes. Let's see. Here's a, a thing, Matt, that you do that really pisses me off. I will just go on and on answering a question. And then I find later that you already answered it very succinctly. Uh, thanks, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, cap is short for capacitors, Bob. Bob. Uh, it just takes, sometimes it takes too long to say capacitors, so we just say filter caps. Film caps, signal ca caps, coupling caps. Uh, we wear a lot of different caps around here. I have no opinion on the legendary Tones Hot Mod. Um, I wish them well, but I... Between the name of the company, Legendary Tones, and then calling it the Hot Mod, my radar goes up. David Ellis, you're pretty much approaching the lifespan at 15 years if they haven't been used, if they're just sitting around. Uh, caps dry out. The electrolytic dries up and no longer does what, it, what it's supposed to. So don't put those in an amp. Uh, that's a case where you can try reforming it, bring it up very slowly on a variac, and then testing them afterwards. Uh, the worst thing you can do to any cap capacitor is to let it sit around unused. I've got a I was talking to a guy the other day, and he's got all these nice amps, and he just doesn't play them very often. I said, well, make sure that you at least turn each of them on for like an hour at least once a month. Just keep those caps from drying out. Play them if you can. Um, the worst thing you can do is just let it sit, sit around unused, and that goes for old, new old caps in storage. I... I would not buy 15-year-old caps, even if they're never used. Getting some re repeat questions again. I would ask, please, everyone just ask once. And uh, the question marks at the beginning, I see them starting. That really does help. Let's see. Five years is a realistic, a more realistic expectation than 15, yeah. Uh, 
I'm not a big fan of the Deluxe Reverb 2s. They're okay. Um, that was a bad, that was the beginning of a bad period of Fender production. A lot of, uh, a lot of odd choices and, and, uh, a lot of, a lot of spaghetti. But if, if you like them, that's great. Uh, Bob, I've, I've shown s some videos on how to discharge amps so they're not holding any voltage. Voltage is different from, but um, it works hand in hand with current. Um, but there's there's so many videos out there on that. Um, look at Uncle Doug's channel. I imagine he, he would have that up there. Um, a, a pretty good how-to. Hey JDS, I've never had, I've never seen a, a, a WIM amp in person. I have no opinion of WIMs. All I know about WIM is that Gilmore used to use their their speaker caps. Fred Weather, I don't I don't know. I don't keep up with the market uh, value and uh, if if that amp's worth more to someone because if it has the original pull boost, that person's got wool between their ears. Um, on more than one level, um, that's a nasty circuit, and the amp's much better without it. Uh, but uh, I don't keep up with the resale value. I keep up with the musical value, if that makes sense. Uh, I have worked on carbon amps. I don't know if my opinion is a consensus, but I agree. With, we agree with me uh, that carbons are fairly, fairly cheap. I. I uh, Put them with crate, um, uh, or or just a little bit below. Some of them have really cut a lot of corners. Um, you know, not a, many of them have held up any value. So there are uh, many of them where uh, it would cost more to repair them than they're worth. So sometimes, sometimes it's better to get something else. But if you have a carbon. And it's working for you, and you love it. You're not wrong. Congratulations. Great. Emmett, you got the gout for your birthday. My God. I try to avoid any diseases most associated with Henry VIII. Oof. Well, uh, I, d I did not have gout, uh, but I, I did have a good birthday. Um, though I don't remember what we did. I think I did a whole lot of nothing, which was pretty much ideal and rare for me. Sorry about the gout, man. I haven't. I don't know that I've ever known anyone with gout before. I assume it's treatable now. I assume there are pills or something. You don't just have to suffer while you eat your joints of meat and wonder why, why your foot hurts. Let's see. Any recommendations for reliable low noise 12 x 7 7 JJ's have had a problem lately losing vacuum for mysterious reasons. I think they had some defects in the, gl in the glass, and I hope that that's been resolved. I, I have not had that in a while, but I, for, for a, about a year, it was fairly constant. Um, the, the one I like the most right now is not always available. It's the TAD uh, Red Base Premium. 7025. Those have been fantastic when I can get them, but um, the vendors seem to be out of them right now. I've also had very good luck recently with the Letcher Harmonics 7025. I do not like the Letcher Harmonics 12EX7. That's the one with the yellow print, but the 7025 with the silver print, I've had very good luck with. Hey, Jim Vern. Appreciate that. Sorry, uh, Vernie. Jim Vernie. What are my thoughts on Tone King and Magnetone? Looking at a Royalist Mark III or Super 15, build-wise is one better than the other. I have done uh, videos on the Tone King Sky King. I have not had the Royalist Mark III. And I do have a video up on the Super 15. Since I have not seen the Royalist, I cannot speculate, though they're both built in the same factory. Um, I know that no, they're not. Magnet, Magnetone's not not a BAD, sorry. Um, 
as I have not worked on the Royalists, but I've worked on other Tone Kings, and I, as I have worked on the Super 15, but, but I have worked on other series of Magnetones that were better built than the Super 15, I cannot tell you specifically between those two models which is better. Um, the Royalists is the, the new do everything Marshall. I hope it's fantastic, but I've not had one in. Super 15, I think, is w- well built, but incredibly overpriced. Like, priced twice what it should cost. Um, um, I don't keep up with the uh, vintage resale value of, like, you know, we're talking about modic. A Princeton does affect the, the, the resale value. But I, I try to keep cost in, in mind when I evaluate amps. I thought the Super 15 was okay, nothing fancy, and certainly not justifying its price point. But I don't know um, if the Royalist is fantastic. I'm not a fan of the Sky King for reasons I got into on those videos, but Tom King stepped up and took care of that and a lot of the Sky King owners. So... Um, they're very different sounding apps. I'd play each and then see if, if and play some others because at that price range, you should look at Sir, you should look at um, Friedman, you should look at um, uh, Metropolis. There are a lot of really good options in that price range. It just depends on what has a sound that you want, uh, the look that you want that matters. Top Hat's another great choice in that price range. And then um, if, once you narrow it down based on, hey, I love the sound of these, then find out specifically about the build quality if you can. And I'm sorry I can't tell you more specifically, but I, I can't pretend to know something just to be the guy on the Internet who, who knows stuff. Hey, Expedition 18, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, I don't do DIY kit, kits myself, so it's hard for me to say. And I've had so... Uh, I've had some kit amp builds come in for me to, to make work because uh, the builder, um, for various reasons and to various degrees, got in over their heads. I would say that the two safest ones are that I ha- have experience w- with are the Tube, uh, tube Depot and um, uh, uh, Mojo Tone kits. And while I don't agree with everything in every one of their kits as far as instructions or, or the bill of materials, you won't, they're not going to be giving you bad results. Uh, I will say specifically avoid all the Weber kits. Those are junk. And I like the speakers very much. Yeah. If you show up to a gig and they don't have grounded power, do not play there. Tell all your musician friends, do not play there. Boycott the place. If they can't get a band worth hearing because no one will play there, they're going to uh, either up their electricity or they're going to switch to DJs. But either way, you know. I have no experience with the Weber Z Matcher, Jojo. Um, I'd be very, very cautious. Uh, of Weber uh, electronics, and I don't mean any dis- to. I don't mean to be mean, but I think that their speakers are great, and everything else I've had from them along the electronics line has had major issues. So, yeah, Lion Circle. The, the new magnetones are not at all like the old magnetones. Uh, the new magnetones, even the ones which sound the most like the old magnetones, like the, can't remember the model with the harmonic trim. It's a Fender Deluxe Reverb with the old magnetone harmonic trim added to it as opposed to the old magnetone circuit with the magnetic magnetone trim, uh, which is an odd choice to me, but it's probably what more people will actually like because the old magnetone circuit, aside from the trim, had some weirdnesses to it, uh, but it's what you got. I don't have any thoughts on the Duncan 8440, Curtis. Sorry. So uh, Stumac started adding kits too, Matt. As far as I know, Stumac is partnering with Mojotone. It might be um, more or less the same. (laughs) 
Yeah, I've had uh, the the artisan thirty in uh, uh, true. Uh, true, true Mertwin. That's a hard one to say. True, true Mertwin. Um, the Black Star Thirty was a pretty good copy of an AC Thirty, and the artisan stuff is much better built than their regular line. Um, it had some bad solder joints on the bottom of the board, which were easy to fix once I reached them, but it was hard to reach them because the way the thing was built. Um, I think they're good for a black star. Very, very good for a black star. I'm not sure that they're um, any better in any way than, than various Voxes. And they're in the same price range. Thanks, Jeremy Tapero. Let's see... Digital sucks. <laughs> I decided that he liked to have a two, have to have a two amp, not want to have, have to have. I, I like the sixty five better than the sixty eight. Yeah, the sixty eight is just so bad. Sixty five is just so simple and good. Just at home, Princeton or Deluxe Reverb you prefer twelve inches. There are uh, Princeton's with twelve inches. Um, some of the Princeton's with twelve inches core are, come in like tweed and stuff that I don't care for. I don't like the I don't like a tweed covering on a Fender Reverb amp. I, that's purely aesthetic. I think they're separate eras and should be kept separate aesthetically. Uh, a Prince, you need to play a Princeton with a twelve, a Princeton with a ten, and a Deluxe Reverb reissue, and you will know pretty quickly. Um, and you also need to, see if you can, try it with. Uh, different speakers that may come in the examples on the showroom floor, like the Deluxe Reverb Reissue is in general a more versatile amp than the Princeton, but the Deluxe Reverb Reissue comes with a uh, Jensen C12K, which is a pretty uh, unpleasant speaker in a lot of ways, whereas the Princeton comes with, with um, either a Creamback uh, 65 or a um, uh, uh, C, uh, C Rex and all three of those speakers sound very different. So you can't say, well, I like the Princeton into the 12 better than the Deluxe and the 12 when the, the 12 may be very different things. Um, some guys are going to love the Princeton. I, I would choose the Deluxe Reverb over the Princeton just because it has uh, a lot more flexibility, a lot more variety, a lot more potential uses for not a lot more, more money. It doesn't weigh a lot more, isn't a lot larger. And if you keep the volume down at two, you know, it's comparable to a Princeton. And Julian Lodge sounds just fine with the volume on two. Nah, Silverfish, almost every uh, Fender reverb amp in the, in, it made in the 60s had an AT7 in, uh, for the phase inverter. And the phase inverter circuit was designed for AX, but they use an AT and they're just fine. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. I do not have any experience with the Cord Cornford Hurricanes. Uh, notice I use the the uh, Cornford approved pronunciation of the Hurricane. Uh, his effects loop is an issue that when anything is plugged into the amp, just cuts out and seems really distant. Um, any, are you using the full effects loop, um, send and return, or are you just going into the return? Um, I don't know whether the, the Cornford has any uh, level adjustment for that or whether it's tube or solid state I don't know um, I have <coughs> I have heard the Cornford Hurricane as played by um, um, Paul um, um, can't think of his name right now fantastic Scottish player I love him well, I was playing, I can't think of his name right now. I've heard him play that. Uh, I think he's got the Hurricane. Uh, but that's all. That's the only experience I have with it. So contact Cornford. I bet they'll take care of you. And why can't I remember his name? Hey, David A., thank you very much. My opinion of Victory Amps, uh, they're fine. Uh, eventually they're going to be relatively expensive to repair when they inevitably need repair, as all amps do, because of the way the construction is done. Um, but they sound really good. They're built really well for the price. Not not Chris Buck, K-Major, uh, Scottish guy. Um, 
God, I'm going to, I'm going to find them real quick. Uh, the, the, the victory, I think they're a little bit expensive for what you get, but they're really good at what, you know, they, they, uh, they come through with what they promise. Um, uh, I, I, I worry a little bit about, um, them being rugged for use live because the way they're built with a metal lunchbox thing. Show my subscriptions. Where is he? He just posted something not that long ago, I thought. See, now I've gone and subscribed to too many people. Is there a way to search? I know this is not the best use of, of our time together. I'm sorry. I just want to get his names. And I even uh, you know, have given him a shout out in previous videos. Paul Stafford Cook. Of course, Paul Stafford Cook. I got as far as Paul, and then I started to say David, and I thought, well, everyone knows Paul Davids, and and uh, I've never heard him play the Cornford. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of of the uh, cannabis Rex either, Chris R. But yeah, victory victories are good if you enjoy if you enjoy it, go forth and and, and enjoy it. Um, for that price range, I think there's some other things uh, you should also play. You might like better. Thanks, Charlie Plate, on the SVT advice thing. Um, let's see here. Uh, see you, Matt Fields. All right. Uh, we've got a super chat here from Mike. Thank you. Any tips for ensuring a Yamaha P90 Revstar standard with treble bleed of standard? Can achieve those glassy cleans when you roll back the volume when using vintage fuzzbox circuits. Uh, I'm trying to, yeah, the current production Revstar standard has a treble bleed. I don't know about the previous Rev, uh, version one, uh, but the version two, which is the current one, has a treble bleed, which I don't much care for. Um, I can't imagine that it would not maintain clean uh, the glassy cleans when you roll back the volume using a, an old fuzz box um is you're never going to have truly glassy cleans when you're running into a, a an old fuzz unless the fuzz is on because the way the impedance of an old fuzz face etc loads uh loads the uh the uh, the pickup mm. And the other thing with the, the Revstar is the bridge pickup is mounted a little bit farther from the bridge than it is on other P90 guitars that traditionally have that set up like a junior or a special. And so they don't quite have the high, highs on the, uh, on the bridge pickup. So you may want to go to the middle position or the neck pickup when you're doing that if you want to get that. Because uh, it, it will, with that treble bleed, really gets very bright on that guitar. And so if you go to the neck pickup or the middle position and you turn on the, the volume, you're going to have a lot of treble. You're going to have the best res uh, ch chance of maintaining what you're looking for with the fuzz. Whereas the bridge pickup on that guitar, when you roll it off, yeah, the treble bleed's there, but it's a real mid-range forward pickup. You may not be getting what you want. But um, I don't have any more specific tips for that. Um, Wrench on the loose. I'm not sure. Uh, Joey R. Hamilton. No, th I'm wearing uh, the Speedy homage today. Just a li little lowly uh, Pagani design, but it's a, a very nice Uncle Seiko uh, Omega spec bracelet. So I only saved $6,900. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, 
75 YBA, I have a con clone and a BB clone, no rat. What am I to do? Well, get a, get a, get a rat clone. I, according to the internet this week, because almost every channel had them all at the same time, um, Keeley's got uh, four new overdrive distortion goodie pedals, which do various things. And, and, and in fairness, his, his rat inspired one, uh, which I think also had some super distortion, not super distortion, uh, SD1 uh, DNA in it, did look like a very promising pedal. And it looks quite nice. Uh, and I like Robert Keeley, and, and I admire Robert Keeley. Uh, I just, when any product comes out where all the same channels have the same product on the same day, and they're all nothing but that and how great it is, my eyes just rolling up in the back of my head. Uh, but you could also just find a used rat for 75 bucks. Rats are fun. Rats are really good pedals. They're just not in, uh, in fashion very much anymore. But maybe the, the Keeley thing will, will fix that. Seth B., I love Germanian, Germanium diodes. I used to be able to get them all the time, too. And um, the good ones, the glass ones, uh, are harder and harder to get in good shape. Hey, old guy. Uh, no news on Excalibur yet. I'm trying to get, trying to get some. I got a, I've got a lead. It's just uh, time and money. And when I have time, I don't have the money, and vice versa. And the audio is excellent. Thank you. I did, I did tweak the audio for today's stream, and I changed all the, the, the lighting settings for today's stream. I think I'm getting better at this. Uh, the audio change was just I, I high passed at 130 hertz. Is that right? Or 150 hertz versus 80? Let's see here. I know this is riveting stuff. Uh, uh, oh, it's 160. So I'm high passing at 160 hertz versus 80 uh, because uh, I, I tend to be down there anyway and can be boomy, or so I have been told. But I'm really pleased for the lighting uh, and color balance changes, which I won't go on about because it's very camera geek stuff, but uh, I, I, I've, I've really enjoyed learning how to do all this stuff. And every every couple of weeks, I feel like I make another breakthrough. Thank you, Hans. Uh, ben Sturosti, that's very nice. And say hello to your wife for me. I appreciate that. That's very nice. These things mean a lot to me. Not in not in an um, egotistical way, or I should hope not. But it it it's it it feels really good to know that. Um, that I'm reaching people across the world. And it's not because of, uh, I don't know, there's always some level of ego in it. But, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm a world traveler um, uh, by inclination, but, but not by, by a, a wallet. So if it were up to me, I'd be traveling the world all, all the time, and I just can't do it. It's not feasible. So this this means a lot to me because I don't want to be spend my time on this earth hyper focused on one little chunk of this earth so uh, i guess that makes sense to me at least hey P pf i'm glad that i was able to help you uh axe effects are cool man axe effects are great um the, the the current ones with all the revisions are just phenomenal the caveats that I had in the Amps Under Five Hundred Dollars video and Amps Under Thousand Dollars video were about digital stuff. You know, I mentioned the the katanas and the and the catalysts and the Fender things and the uh, and the, like the HG stomp. Where's HX stomp? Sorry, I always mix up with HG TV. HX stomp. Those are all caveats based on that price range. Once you get up to the the fractal stuff. Um, a lot of those caveats fall away. It's just a high price of ownership and you know the risk that you invest all this money into the latest and greatest, and then two years later, a new latest and greatest comes out, and your old latest and greatest isn't worth as much. You know, So digital still has its weaknesses from that perspective, but the sounds are really, really quite good. I don't know that the feels is there yet. I have not had a chance to, to, to spend much time with the newest, latest, and greatest uh, fractals, because I'd frankly I'd rather travel than spend that much for a digital box that will have a um, a shelf life um, as far as 
market viability. But uh, whereas the old vintage Fender and Foxes and Marshalls will always be what they are, uh, no one's going to say, well, yeah, that 68 Super Lead is great and all, but the new one's got Bluetooth. So I'm, I'm, I am slightly frightened by what Fractal's doing because at some point the, the writing's going to be on the wall. It's not quite there yet, but they're making great strides. And um, a long time ago, I, I knew the guy who was doing that. And I spoke to him a few times. Really, really an interesting guy, really quite smart um, and passionate about it. Let's see. Hey, Bruce, man, you may please have some help with the problem if I have some help to give. He's got a hand-wired Princeton reverb reissue. Uh, with a reverb tank disconnected, volume at one reverb. Yeah, if you have the reverb tank disconnected, uh, you don't want to have the reverb level turned up or you're going to have hum and noise and, and buzz. Uh, only only turn up the reverb knob if the reverb tank is connected. If the reverb t tank is connected and you have bad hum or buzz when the uh, reverb is turned up, you either have a problem with V uh, uh, three in your in your app with the Princeton, or you have a problem with the tank. But if you have the tank disconnected, you turn the reverb up, you will have noise. Hey, Joey R., thoughts on tweaking a, Marshall, a 1986 Marshall 2204 to match the pre-1983 circuit? It's really primarily just a matter of adding one more filter node. If you look at the 83 and earlier schematic versus the post-83 schematic, they, they left out one filter node. So there's a, one fewer, uh, one less 10K, uh, two or three watt resistor, and one less filter cap. So you can add that inside the amp if you want to. Uh, the easiest way to do that would be to, uh, uh, you need to cut a trace uh, or, 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 or two and run some wires, but you could get a can clamp mount that goes inside the chassis and get a 50 microfarad dual section uh, FNT or whatever and just use one section of it um, and just have a 10K resistor uh, on a terminal strip uh, so there's your dropping, and then you just run the wires. That's the mo the biggest difference between the two. And you can, there are a couple of other small differences, um, but really, uh, the so this biggest thing that affects the sound is that is that is that lack of a of a filter node. Well, Ted, I use COG and MPO as well, uh, but best ceramic cap is not always the best sounding ceramic cap. Um, if I were designing a, something to work in a satellite, yeah, you're absolutely right. But sometimes the imperfections um, sound better in a guitar amp. And in my experience and a lot of other techs' experience, the 562 series, which are uh, not as as good a capacitor, do better, uh, sound sound more interesting. They're not as uh, flawed as the old 500 volt uh, class Z, you know, the Z ratings that they find in old Fenders. Uh, but the class two uh, 562 Rs have a have a particular sound, and we're talking about subtle distinctions but but real um so you know nothing wrong with using cog or mpo but i'm not looking for stab stability at all uh, at all temperatures and i'm not looking for even frequency response uh the things which make things a little bit interesting are are the flaws but you know it's an easy thing you can buy, buy a cog buy an mpo buy 562 and put them on a switch and see what you think Usually takes a lot, uh, like do it like all of them within an app between that type and this type of here. It's very subtle differences.
Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I'm I'm not a uh a fan of the code. Um uh, I don't remember if I've tried the ID Core one hundred. Um I know the Bandit one twelve can sound awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Curtis. Appreciate that. Impressions and espresso. Uh, it doesn't matter if yeah. Uh, uh, if a five F if a five F six A chassis fits in an HRD cab, fantastic. I did not know that. Um, I, I I thought the dimensions would be off, but um, yeah, the the stock chassis is a. Uh, is is uh, tough to reuse just because of the, the big the oversized holes for the, where the tube sockets go. Yeah, Fender's made some really good solid state amps back in the in the late eighties and early nineties. Stefan, um, stage one eighty five, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're really good, really nice cleans. Some of them even had pretty good choruses. Um, typically, pretty good reverbs, and some of them even had interesting overdrives. Uh, kind of in a Oh, you know, it's a very 80s thing. It's kind of that GK sound. It's very uh, momentary lapse of reason kind of sounds. Uh, not quite as nice as what you get from the, some of those GK MLs, but along those lines, uh, I think, uh, you know, and they're kind of sleepers because people, other than the Radiohead freaks, people have forgotten about them. Let's see. Well, Alan Harvey is greeting us from a soggy and miserable Stockholm. Well, you knew it was Stockholm when you when you were born there, man, or you moved there. Stockholm sounds like a beautiful town with way too much herring. All right, on that note, we're going to take another seven-minute intermission. I appreciate you all being here, and we'll catch you guys in seven.
Ah, how's that for timing? All right, let's see here. Where were we? Do, 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 do. Yeah, uh, uh, hey, Caesar. The way I take uh, excess solder off a brass ground plate is, uh, you know, use a, I use an 80-watt iron as my chassis iron, um, and uh, I get in there first with a solder sucker and then with a little bit of braid if, if there's any follow-up, and then it comes right up. And before I do anything else, I get in there with a very small chisel tip screwdriver and break up any bits of flux that are sticking around. And uh, then I clean the whole thing off with some isopropyl and then I reflow everything and it works really well. Um, you, but you have to have a very, very hot iron to do that work. And uh, it's possible to have an iron that's too hot. I used to have 120 watt iron for that and it was just impossible to control and very easy to burn all the flux up. Uh, but the 80 watt Weller, it's in the description of all my regular videos where I list the things I use. I've got that iron listed, and it's like 80, 90 bucks. I highly recommend it. Let's see here. Good cell amps. Yeah, I've had a one or two in Anthony Mancini, and they're really good. Um, I think in that price range, I, for whatever reason, I'm more drawn towards Germino, which is another great one to, to check out. But good cells are also very, very good, and for some reason, they, they fall off my particular personal radar, uh, and I can't tell you why. Aloha, Victor. Hey, Eric Warrington, he just put Mesa tubes in his base breaker 15 in the preamp and groove tube 84s in the power section. Are these any good? Well, the good news is Mesa tubes are Sovtex, and groove tubes are typically either Sovtex, Electroharmonics, or JJs. So they're all fine, but uh, don't pay for anything that's branded Mesa. Don't pay for anything that's branded groove tubes. Uh, they, these are not manufacturers of tubes. They buy tubes. They put their logo on it. They sell them um, in box stores like Guitar Center, et cetera, uh, Z Zounds and all that. Um, and Mesa just likes to have Mesa on things. It's like earlier in the chat, we're talking about companies putting their, their own branding on capacitors. They're not making capacitors. They're not making tubes. They're just putting their logo on it. And sometimes there's an upcharge. Never buy like Gold Lion or, or any of the crazy cryogenically frozen stuff. And don't waste your money even on gold pin tubes. Just... That's just a way to uh, separate you from your from your wallet. Yeah, Paul Johnson, uh, Dave Halford does. I almost said Rob Halford. Uh, 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 Dave Halford, <laughs> very different, does fantastic reconing. And uh, if if your speaker, if there's still a recone kit available for that speaker, I don't know what speaker you have or he ha if, if Dave knows if a different uh, cone would work, he does a phenomenal job. Sometimes, though, there are speakers uh, for that either uh, there are no good parts available to rebuild or that weren't that great to begin with, and he will tell you. Uh, he has uh, as many opinions on, on speakers as I do about the amps, and he is not shy with them. But they're honest and uh, opinions derived from decades of being in the trenches. Gooden, you are falling apart yet, man. I am so sorry. Uh, yeah, you might want to plug your heart first and then worry about your toe, but not a good combination of things. And I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, Chris Quinn. Yeah, it's called a... F Post phase inverter master volume in general, and the type I like is called the Larmar L A R dash M A R. It's because of the guys who first posted it on one of the Marshall forums. Were a, a guy named Larry. He's a really good tech in, in Germany and Marstrand. Um, and they both. Came, I don't know if they both posted it independently or they came up with it together. It's it's a it's a very sensible thing, and in some of my videos. I've shown how it works. I've drawn it out for people. 
It's a, it's a simple thing. Hey, Brett, I uh, found another pair of GT uh, KT66s. One of them failed the grid emission test. Can I explain what that means electronically and, and tone-wise? Ah, well, electronically, that means that the grid uh, can be emitting voltage. <laughs> it should not. It can be uh, getting voltage from the grid, uh, coming to the grid from the plate or from the screen, which is not ideal because um, you can really damage things in your bias supply if, if the DC gets thrown off that way. As far as the tone-wise, it means you're going to have hums and buzz and nasty sounds, and um, it, it, it's no damn good. That's the technical term. If it's failing the grid emission test, is no damn good. Um, so... Uh, don't, don't, don't put them in your amp. It won't be happy. Hey, Victor B, you've got the uh, old Pro Junior with the blue frame 10-inch. Um, uh, if you want to make it sound better, if you like the way it sounds now, that's great. Uh, the things that fail on a Pro Junior are the same things that f fail on a, on a Blues Junior. The filter caps fail. The input jack fails. Uh, the screen grid resistors are 100 ohms, and they, they will fail eventually. Uh, you can have problems with the, two, the EL84 getting too hot and burning the traces on the board. And, uh, and specifically in the Pro Junior, the pots are really fragile little things. It can be very stressed. <clears throat> Pardon me. So be very careful adjusting the knobs on those. Thank you, Our Life in Wyoming. I'm glad it made it, made it more better for you. Let's see. Hey, Jimmy John, I appreciate that. This is coming from a watch nerd. Yeah, I, I try to not put too much of myself into the channel. I mean, it's obviously my channel. It's my my voice and my hands and all the amps and all that. But you know, it's it's it. I, it needs to be about the apps, not about me. But occasionally, I, I think it's nice for, to give people a sense of who I am. Uh, maybe one day we'll do my my um, my uh, carbon steel skillet collection. No one, no one, crickets. Wah wah. But yeah, it's 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 nice to put that kind of thing out there occasionally. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a modest collection of mostly inexpensive pieces that make me happy for various reasons. I've got the, the two Hamiltons that are that are a bit more, but compared to all the guys out there with the Omega and, and Rolex collections, you know, um, all my watches together cost less than the sales tax for one of their watches. Let's see. Apparently, uh, people are trying to convince uh, Gooden that uh, cherry pie is good for gout. So I think any time that someone's telling you that uh, cherry pie is is take, best taken for medicinal reasons, you should heed their advice because clearly uh, that's good advice. Unless it's unless it's warrant, in which case disregard. Well, Mike, I'm glad to be able to be assistance there. As a Brit, he's just learned the British English pronunciation of hurricane. You're very welcome. Uh, I don't think you've ever, since World War II, I don't think England has ever, or Great Britain has ever experienced a hurricane. Because uh, in Hereford, Hartford, and Her Hertshire, Her Herefordshire, Herefordshire, that's what it is, yeah. Hurricanes hardly ever happen. Ever happen. God, I'm sorry. I have, have not... Uh, have not, I did not know that I needed to do my fair lady today, or I would have practiced it. Erkins Ali have it happen, uh, but uh, yeah, 
yeah. Arakans and Spitfires used to be very, very important. I wonder if anyone knows what I was just talking about. Um, I have heard nothing but good things about Headstrong App Stealth Parrot, and I know that uh, if they were not up to up to snuff, uh, JD Simo and and Zach Childs would not like them, and they do, and they use them. So I look forward to checking them out myself at some point. Uh, but I've I've heard nothing but good things for them. Hey, you know, my birthday is, is not the Ides of March, but my, my dog Bella's birthday is the Ides of March. So we got that going for us. No, I'm, I'm earlier in February. I don't really make a big deal about birthdays anymore. Uh, Trouble bleeds mess with everything. I, I, I don't use, I don't use, uh, uh, treble bleeds in my guitars. I take them out of clients' guitars whenever possible. And no client has ever been like, put that back. Whatever happens with that OR100 in the hum it had, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, if I had an OR100 and it hummed, I assume I fixed it, uh, but I don't recall. Hey, Dark Side Zeke, I have not played or worked on any Hayden amps or Framus Rubies, sorry. Let's see. Go to 6L6 tube brand. Uh, that's tough because I keep getting good ones and then I'll order more for that same brand in the next batch. Wildly inconsistent. I think right now I'm I'm back in the EH waters. For a long time, I was having really great luck with uh, tongue saw. And I just had a pair of tongue saws that lasted about 30 days for a customer. I was using the TAD Red Base. Had some weird issues with those. So now I'm back to electroharmonics. I have not found a fantastic one in some time. And John Hoke, oh wow, your videos have got me through many chemo treatments with my son and long nights, childhood cancer sucks. Oh, oh John, man, um, my heart's with you as a dad and my love goes out to your son and uh, well, you know, that's, that's really tough and anything that I can do to if if anything I've done has accidentally have been of comfort to you, I'm I'm really glad. Uh, John's got a Park P eighteen hundred, a Mitch Colby eighteen watt amp. Would I recommend a twelve eighteen the phase inverter instead of a twelve x seven to help smooth it out? Um, cannot hurt it, so try it and see what you think. Uh, you can also play around with fifty seven fifty ones in in V one or V two, and you can even play around. Um, with some of the medium gain uh, 12x7s, if if the 5751 is too much, or the eight or an AY7, if you want, none of these will hurt it. Um, you can also reach out to Mitch. Uh, he's a really nice guy. Tends to answer the phone, uh, and he knows that amp certainly better than I do. Um, I'm going to have Mitch on the channel pretty soon here, on when the uh, technical difficulties resume. Uh, wow. Um, I, my wife has a very good friend um, who's two children, uh, both had the exact same form of very rare cancer. And the older daughter went through this whole long process of six years and she's in remission and seemingly doing fantastically. And then it, after that, the younger brother, her, uh, the son developed this exact same rare form of cancer. And, the, and so the whole thing started again. And they, we've just been watching this family being ground away and, and you know just worn down and then coming back and uh, I hope that in a few years that both children will have gone through this and I hope that yours will have too but I have witnessed how it grinds people down and uh, that's one of the many reasons why um, when I do the announcement for the giveaway for the 50th 
50k subscribers with a pass that on the channel I've been busy. Uh, we're we're going to do an app giveaway on the channel, and all all of the proceeds, not the profits, all of the proceeds, every dime is going to St. Jude's, which is a local children's cancer um, charity um, to help uh, people like John and his son, um, both with research and, and free treatments and free places for families to stay and, and groceries and all this stuff. It's it's uh, it's a lot, and I try to make this channel just about you know all the toys that we like but then the reality comes in so it's going to be a way to maybe give back and we can all do that so john um you you did not have to give me a dime um wow i uh, hope your son pulls through uh i can only imagine Back to uh, back to talk about toys. Hulk Hoagie, hey, how hot should a rectifier tube get? As as hot as a rectifier tube should? There's a way to make that a, a tongue twister, but I, I I'm not awake enough to. Is it normal for one to be so hot that it makes front panel of the amp too hot to touch? Thanks. No, it's not normal for the front panel of an app to get too hot to touch from a rectifier. Uh, the, the odd exception might be in like a fender basement or something with a hang down design where the tube is down below, and the and the uh, front panel is really the top panel, in which case the heat rising. Um, 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 but um, uh, the uh, rectifier tubes get hot enough that they will burn the ever-living shit out of you if you touch them. But it's not normal for the front panel to get too hot to touch. So make sure that your power transformer is not acting up. Oh, so J Joey R. Sorry, yeah, Hamilton, Ontario. That's right, the Toronto <laughs> adjacent town. I was looking for. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, crossover worlds. Yeah, Hamilton. That's 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 uh, Neil Peart's from Hamilton, and um, and my friends uh, Chris Church and and Ted Woodford are both in Hamilton, uh, but I don't know anyone in uh, in uh, Montreal. I'd love to though. Yeah, Scott Pickett, Paul Saffer Cook. Um, I've not tried the JJ Double Micas yet, Ted Mitch. I'm looking forward to it. Let's see. Thank you, David Gallucci. Appreciate that. I'm not sure which, how much wisdom I've accumulated. I'm just an opinionated old cuss. Ah. Uh, Speaking of diodes, would a germanium clipping diode sound different than a shot, uh, shot key diode with the same forward voltage? Unfortunately, yes. And I'll tell you how I know this. I used to make pedals, and one of the pedals I designed a certain um, part of a circuit around, as it any uh, 34, N34s? I can't remember the name. It was an old glass germanium diode that I loved. And all of a sudden... Almost everything on the market was was fakes or broke if you looked at them. And I tried to use shot keys, and I played around and played around. And I finally found a shot key that gave a different sound that I liked, but it, I never got the same sound that the Germanians did, gave. It may depend on how they're used, but at least as, as a clipping diode, no, uh, shot key is not a, a, a direct sub for uh, a Germanium. Hey, Fletch is 40. Um, bad hum in 15-watt mode. I imagine it's not the crappy switches. I imagine that it's the uh, the output tubes aren't well-matched. Uh, if, if you have a 30-watt mode and a 15-watt mode, if they're turning off one pair of tubes, you may be having mismatched output tubes at that, at that point, which in which case you wouldn't have common mode cancellations. You're going to have a uh, – can be a fairly dramatic increase in hum. So before you um, – start changing anything inside the amp try a different uh quad of tubes i assume it's a it, since it's a you call it a bc30 i don't know the epiphone app that's some kind of ac30 uh homage and if you know, probably with four el84s uh you may just have the wrong combination of tubes or we may need to get four new el84s
Hey, Gregory Hill Sr. Um, what would be a good beginner oscilloscope? Well, it's, it's tricky because in theory, you should be able to go to ham fests or uh, estate sales, etc., and maybe find some old analog thing. But you have to already know how to use a scope fairly well to tell if it's working. And um, if you, it's hard to fix the scope without a scope. Um, in general, I would say probably the Rigol digital scopes are the way to go. You can see it there. And I don't remember the model number, but in all my regular videos, at least for the last year or so, I've got all the gear listed, including that model number. And that was uh, fairly inexpensive as scopes go, and it works really well. Now, someone, if you if you have a friend who does this, they could help you find an old used analog scope from the 70s or 80s and maybe working just fine, pick up for 50, 60 bucks. Um, but unless you have someone to hold your hand through that process, you may just throw 50, 60 bucks away on some old beige plastic box that doesn't work. Whereas... Um, one of the new Rigols is is kind of work out of, out of the box, yeah, so to speak. Uh, but uh, there may be other people who better with better answers than I have. Hey, Brienne R. Uh, advice of master volume to, to mod to Silvertone fourteen eighty four. It's a little bit tricky just because of the way the, the construction is done, but you know it, it's it's a push pull amp. Uh, you know it's a class A B amp. You can use uh, uh, the Larmar would be my preference on that because it behaves just like every other class A B amp and it works very well. You'd probably want to put it on the rear panel um, because you don't want to drill out um, the front panel on one of those um, uh, unless you wanted to use one of the well, uh, I guess all the switches on the front panel are, are, are really necessary for that app. Um, um, unless there's a polarity switch. But that's so far away from the output tubes. Now, you want to put it on the rear panel. Larmar on the rear panel would be the best option, but you could, might get along just fine with with just doing a, a pre-phase inverter, simple master volume like you'd find on a 70s uh, twin reverb. With any 1484, especially if uh, 6v6s instead of 6l6s, watch the bias. They have a weird non-adjustable biasing, and it's really tricky to get it the way it's supposed to be. Let's see. Good is making fun of my herring aversion. So I know how far back in the chat we are. All right. What is my go to Fender amp? Oh, I've got a, a few favorites. Um, I don't have any one particular favorite. Um, uh, overall usefulness, probably a Vibrolux reverb because it's big enough for larger things and small enough for smaller things and it, it has a certain character I really like. Um, but, you know, I also like... I, I like at least one app from every era from the 50s to the 60s and um, I like them for different reasons. Yeah, you know, I... You know, could, could I... I can't say a 58 Baseman is better or worse than a 65 Super Reverb there, but they're very different amps, even they have the same uh, general wattage and, and the logo is, 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 you know, not, well, actually the logo changed, but the company's the same. My guitar journey. Here's the real one. Here's the real question. I just bought a car Mercury. He's never had a tube amp before and loves it, or she... I don't know. Um, how should I go about learning how the different settings affect the tone? I mean, what the thought process should be. Nothing that you can do from the outside of the amp with the knobs will hurt the amp. 
So you cannot make a mistake, number one. That's the best thing to, to go forward with. Uh, the other thing is um, you should really take the time. I'm trying to remember what uh, with the car Mercury. Let me look up the Mercury's control panel real quick so, so I don't tell you something incorrect because I'm misremembering. Sorry, it's been a while since I've had a car Mercury in the sh- in the. Come in. Let me look at the control panel. You know if it's the Mercury 5 or the Mercury whatever? Let's see here. Come on, get get bigger. Get Give me a big picture. All right, so high and low gain switches, boost, reverb, treble, mid, bass, then the output power. All right, that's right. It's a treble. It's a Fender tone stack, pretty much treble mid bass. So start with all three knobs, all three uh, treble middle bass at noon, and uh, start with the low gain volume pot about nine o'clock, and the master, you know, the power thing is up as loud as you can stand to be in the room with it, and uh, play around with. Uh, See, does that thing have a bright switch? Some popped up a subscribe thing. I don't think so. I think it's just got two different gain levels. Um, set set the, 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 the low gain volume to about 9, or, nine o'clock. Treble middle bass to noon. Reverb to just where you barely hear it. And see what it sounds like. You want it brighter? Pick closer to the bridge. Use a different pickup. You want it darker? Pick closer to the neck. You want louder? Play harder. You want so- quieter? Play softer. Really learn that, and then bring up the treble a little bit. See where it changes. Bring the mids up and down. See where it changes. Play with the bass. See where it changes. But first, start with them all at noon and just get a baseline sense of what this amp is. And then turn the volume up from 9 o'clock to like 11 o'clock. And can you play, can you physically play uh, gently enough that you're still at the volume level that you had at 9 o'clock, unless you dig in, in which case the amp jumps out at you? Um, if is the amp begin to break up when you get it to 11 o'clock with your guitar, roll your. Get a sense for that, and then how quiet you can play with your fingers. Then if you turn your volume da- knob down from 10 to 8, where does that bring you? Um, really spend a lot of time with all the minutia. Don't, don't, don't think the amp is generating the entire sound. Remember, remember that you need to play along the string. Where you, where you pick, how you pick, whether you use a pick, which pickup is active, whether the guitar volume's on 10 or 7 or 8 or whatever, all these influence things just as much as the controls on the front panel. That's a really good amp, and it will reward this kind of experiment. Then later you can play around with the high-gain stuff and more radical things. But really spend time with it because it's not like any digital model or you might have used before this. Thank you, OB77. I appreciate that. I have, uh, Music Nerd, I have no th- thoughts about the, the Saldano Astro because I've not, uh, I've not tried, uh, tried one, uh, let alone had one in to the shop. So eventually I'll, I'll see one. Uh, Mike Saldano knows what he's doing. I just don't know if, um, if the production facility is executing his idea as well. So... Hey, Wes, I've got cast iron as well, SVT 4001. Um, cast iron has its strengths, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, um, carbon steel is the perfect in-between. 
Matt Smith, what would call, cause a crackling when amp is turned on? There's just way too many things that could cause that. Um, is it you turn on the amp and the amp starts crackling, or is it just a crackling only when the amp is switched on, in which case it could be a, a, a bad or not fully uh, strong solder joint? But it, it's it's hard to it's hard to know from where I'm sitting. I, I I'm sorry. Hey Rob F, glad you're here for, for, towards the end. Yeah, we're gonna go about another 18 minutes. Yeah. Hey Victor, what what? Try to remember what problem you had yesterday that you asked in Keith's video. I don't. I don't remember what your question was, but I remember thinking that's that's an odd problem to have. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I don't recall. Yesterday was forever ago. Hey Walter Kurtz, I'm not a big fan of the Matchless. Uh, they run way too hot, both for tube longevity and the fact that they kill their plastics. The, the 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 control panels warp and crack, and you're paying for a lot of hand work that really was not necessary. Um, I I think if you like the matchless, look and see what Top Hat has in that same price range or that same feature set because you're probably going to get more amp for less money. Uh, with the top hat, and it's got, not going to be money spent on the wrong things. And the matchless just gets so damn hot. I'm not a, and I find the matchlesses are really heavily filtered, and they they sound um, very very stiff in comparison to the Marshalls and Voxes they are derived from. I know that I'm I'm in the minority uh, on that, and that's not what you'd ever read in a guitar magazine. But I've just played too many matchlesses versus old Marshalls and, and Fenders and Voxes. And they're okay. I don't. I don't think they're fantastic. I just don't. And I think they're really uh, unnecessarily expensive to work on. And that's fine for me. I mean, I get paid more to work on a mattress because it takes longer to work on it. Well, but from the owner's perspective, the resistor that takes me two minutes to replace an offender takes me fifteen minutes to replace in a mattress because every resistor is wound multiple times around a terminal. And it next or underneath two other resistor or capacitor leads, and it's all unnecessary. Uh, it doesn't make it stronger, more reliable, more rugged. It's just adherence to some spec that never existed. It, it's not mil spec. Mil spec is you never make a, a single r complete wrap. And mil spec is two seventy degrees, not not three sixty, let alone multiples of three sixty. And the heat thing is really a big deal. Thanks, Digital Sucks. I appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to be the only voice out there. I'm, I'm not trying to be like, I am the the amp expert. I am all that you need. I, I'm just, I'm, I am a voice. I'm one of many voices. I try to be a reasonable voice, and I try to have the best voice. But, uh, you know, the approach everyone's internet opinions with some grain of salt. I mean, I've got like a thousand videos that I, where I have hope, hopefully have backed up uh, uh, some, if not all of the things that I say. Um, but you know, I, I have good friends with whom we have minor disagreements about these things. Cause it, you know, it does at some point the, uh, the science descends to the level of art and craft. And that's when we, we, we th uh, throw mud at each other. Let's see. Hello from New Zealand. Hey, got a new Zetter here. Got a couple of Vox AC30 Custom Classic 2s. Reverb still sounds weak after doing the 470K across the switch lugs and the 28K resistor, correct pan 2. Any thoughts to get it stronger? Um, I don't know what you mean by 470K across the switch lugs. You mean on the dwell thing? Uh, on the uh, second schematic for the AC30 Custom Classic, they show a couple parts which they changed from previous versions, where the previous versions in parentheses. Uh, so look for that schematic. 
it's out there and see if you can find, uh, um, uh, make sure that whichever one you've got there, that all the revisions have been made. Um, uh, the, but the reverb on the custom classic has always sucked. Uh, as far as getting it stronger, it, it's fairly easily done. You look at you want to look at the negative feedback loop on the op amp that's used for the recovery gain, and say it's a two twenty k, try a three sixty k or four seventy k in that in that feedback loop. And that's how you adjust the gain in that. Um, it's fairly easily done, but given the character of the sound from that tank and within that circuit. I used to tell clients, don't worry about it. The amp doesn't really need reverb. Uh, AC30 is traditionally not a reverb amp. If you fix the uh, one bad capacitor, the, the 2.2 nanofarad instead of, a, uh, sorry, the 0.22 nanofarad, sorry, 0.22 microfarad instead of 2.2 microfarad cap on the output of the effects loop, if you fix that, then you have a world of, of reverbs that you can put in the effects loop, which are better than the tank anyway. So I, I've not spent clients' monies on the uh, uh, reverb circuit of the Custom Classic. Hey, his AC15C1 is way too much bass after doing a vintage tone stack correction with the Greenback speaker. Any thoughts there? Um, if you did the uh, tone stack correction correctly, you will not have too much bass. But I don't know what you did. Um, for those not aware, Say this is the base pot in the box. This 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 well, this has been soldered. This is a volume pot from a guitar. But in the box, you would have the input to the base coming here, and in the stock custom series, these two are joined together at ground. Um, and uh, actually, these two are joined together and not grounded. But from the same point on the board, there's a 10K going to ground at all times. And the JMI, what you do is you separate, you lift the connection from this lug to this lug, and you lift the 10K going to direct, directly to ground. Or you can leave the 10K directly to ground and then ground this lug so there's actually a 10K resistor from here to here, and then that's ground. Um, and so that's the change is just from having these two together and not grounded, but a 10K a 10K resistor from this from this point to ground versus having the 10K from this point to ground uh, and this grounded, but this not being joined together. And this is probably the world's worst demonstration, um, but maybe it helps people. If that's not what you did, then, then, you, then that's your, what your issue is. But you won't have too much bass after that's done correctly. Look at the uh, video I've got, Tone Hang with Steve. That's one of the. I'm, I made some very minor mods to his stock AC15C1 with the greenback, and th that tone change is one of the things I'm, I changed about it, and the app came alive. Uh, none of that there, Seth B. We don't keep politics on here, okay? I'm not going to remove it. We're just not going to go there. Can I share tips about 66 to 67 Princeton Reverb EQ? How much is caps resistors before the pot circuit versus caps earlier in the circuit? I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, there, there's no, there's nothing. 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, they're all, they're, the circuit's always the same. Um, uh, can you re rephrase your question, uh, David Roberts? I'm not sure quite what you're asking. Hey, Rob F., I don't have any info about Fat Jimmy amps uh, other than the guy who makes Fat Jimmy speakers. Exact, actually, has them made. They're, they're made by um, Warehouse uh, to his spec, and he sells them as Fat Jimmy. He's on a group of techs. I'm, I'm, I'm a, he's a member of a group of techs I'm also a member of, so I suspect he does good stuff, but I'm unfamiliar with his amplifiers. All right, we're going to be wrapping this up in about nine minutes. Um, uh, so I'm going to zoom down 
and make sure that I have not missed any super chats because it's not fair if someone pays to have something answered and I don't answer it. Um, uh, JM, you're very welcome. I think, okay, good. That's the last one. So I'll try to get back to the regular questions. I try to answer all questions regardless of a super chat bribery, but if someone does ask, you know, does do that, I, I have to, I have to, uh, reply to it. Let's see, where were we? Um, I'm try, I might, I might, uh, s- skip some, and um, uh, just to try to get stuff that I can get in the next couple minutes. Hey, Matt Smith, I, I am building, uh, I have built amps in the past. I hope to build some more, uh, more of a custom series of, of builds rather than a brand. Um, and more on that later. Uh, I have not, Kenneth Widener, I have not had an Amplified Nation amplifier in, so I don't have any opinion of them other than an interview with the uh, guy in charge I heard where he se- seemed to uh, uh, be uh, uh, very interested in what he was doing, though I disagree with some of the things he said, but I- I'd wait to see what his amps actually are before I form an opinion on them. Um, Digital Drew, watch the chat from the beginning because uh, we've uh, discussed a lot of the, the two questions already today. Let's see. Hey, Greg Hill. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for the uh, uh, super chat. And yeah, the Rigol D, apparently that's what I've got, that model number. I can't remember numbers. Um, uh, AC15 questions. Um, oh, uh, I, I, know, I, I don't think I've mentioned that the mixing op amp gets distorted on a, on the reverb on that. Uh, there's some other changes I make into the solid state section of the AC, uh, 30 and AC 15 custom series, uh, but not, uh, uh, that the reverb distorts. I have, uh, or it won't distort. It would just be a lot of reverb. I think you might be thinking of, uh, changes I made to the, uh, uh, blues junior, which has a similar op amp circuit for the reverb, where I do decrease the resistor, um, like you're talking about. Uh, but I don't do that in the AC-15C1. I find that the AC-15C1 reverb level is quite good. Lion Circle says you'll need a tone generator with the O-Scope. You can actually get uh, very good apps for your phone that can make them be signal generators. And then you just need a, a an adapter to go from your phone to quarter inch or whatever you use. That's what I do. I have a signal generator from like the seventies and it looks like the old slider box that set up, you know, old cable box that sat on top of your TV by 1982. Uh, but I, I don't use it anymore. I just have an uh, adapter cable for my iPhone and a really nice app. Let's see. All right, we got another super chat from RCKX, and I think we're going to answer that, and then we're going to have to wrap it up for the day. Vibrato channel on a 61 Super is quite a bit thinner and anemic sounding versus normal. Is that normal? Any mods bring it closer to normal voice? It should not be uh, anemic, but the way the vibrato channel works is that it, it uh, it's to give you the harmonic trim, it splits itself into two halves and each half is out of phase with the, uh, with the, with the other by a certain amount. It's not a full 90 degrees or 180 degrees. And so when they're combined in a certain way, um, and the trim is on, you get that harmonic trim there. Um, but, uh, when their trim is off, you're not supposed to get that phase issue. But if the capacitors have drifted wildly from the original spec in that circuit, like say it's one of them supposed to be 750 picofarad and it measures 30 picofarad, that's when you get 
wild and crazy random phase cancellation that sounds like something you might have. So the first thing to do is to make sure that every capacitor and every resistant and every resistor in that channel measures its correct spec. Most of the resistors you can measure in in, in circuit. Not all of them, but most of them you can. The capacitors you have to lift out of circuit to measure, and that you know, people say, oh, don't disturb an original uh, solder joint. That's when it gets a little bit tricky. Do you want it to be original or do you want it to sound great? So that's 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 just the reality of a 61 Super. Remember that Leo expected the app to be serviced. He made it easy to service because he used to service apps, so he designed it to be serviced. So I think it's ridiculous to worry about original solder joints and fenders. Um, save that for the cork sniffers. It's, a, it's an app, it's supposed to be making music with it. On that note, I think we're going to have to get to the other questions another time. I really appreciate you all spending this time of your, your Saturday uh, with us. And, you know, um, everyone, keep John and his son in your thoughts uh, and be kind to people. Um, and, uh, you know, make lots of noise in the meantime because that's what we do. Have a good week, y'all.